Okay, well, thank you. It's nice to see you. I apologize to all of you that I uh, wasn't able to, uh, to, 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 to make the trip. Uh, please do ask, ask questions, but you should be aware that I can't see the classroom except for a few students. And so uh, uh, my ability to, uh, to, to figure out how things are going will be limited. But by all means, uh, 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 be, free, be free to ask questions. So what I'd like to do in these lectures is give you uh, an overview at different levels of detail on, on the area of, uh, it's, it's listed as social determinants of inequality, but it's really what I want to call it social interactions, which is an approach in economics which tries to integrate its social influences into the, uh, the logic of individual decision making the way that it's standard in economic theory. I've sent you so many lecture notes that if we went through them, it would take 30 hours, not uh, not, not three. Uh, so let me say the, the way to use the notes. Uh, the first set of lecture notes is is I, which I will start with is going to be the heuristic overview of, of various ideas. The second set of lecture notes, which are called theory, will at different levels go through ideas that. Uh, indicate how social interactions have been instantiated in informal economic models. A lecture notes three will be the discussion of the identification problems. In other words, how given data can one under, uh, uh, uncover distinct roles for social influences versus individual level uh, influences. And then the last two sets of lecture notes are actually uh, recent papers that I wrote which apply to these ideas in, uh, in ways that are, that are associated with inequality. So let me, as I said, start with the first set of lecture notes, which are the general ideas about social interactions. And uh, what I want to do in these notes is, first of all, give you a very, uh, you know, a template as to why I see the big picture of things trying to do, specifically in terms of inequality. And I want to make a few comments about the nature of, uh, of modeling social interactions in economic theory. I'll talk something about econometrics. You know, how, and, and again, the emphasis will be on identification. Why, why is it uh, you know, conceptual to uncover a distinct role for social influence versus family or other individual level influences? And then finally, I want to make some comments about public policy. And there, I want to make, uh, draw some relationships between uh, work that's done on the interface of ethics, uh, political philosophy, and economics, and, and these types of models. So with that in mind, let me put on the table a, uh, a theory of inequality. And I don't mean this is a theory of everything, but, this is, but nevertheless, a perspective in thinking about inequality. And, what I, and I, I call it in some work the memberships theory of inequality. And, I, and it has three pieces, and I want to at least argue that many aspects of the study of inequality can be organized uh, along these particular axes. So the first idea in this literature would be, is it, these are really just going to be some propositions, would be the first that if we specify individual preferences, uh, beliefs, or, or opportunities, that these, are, these, these have social determinants. And so what I mean by that is that if we think about the, uh, the, the trinity of what defines uh, economic theory at, at the micro level, is that we think of, of outcomes as being determined by the interplay of an individual's preferences, the way the constraints they face, that's what I mean by opportunities, and the way they think about the world, which is of course what beliefs um, And so the idea is going to be that when I write down a formal model that describes outcomes of whatever type, then I think of each of these components as having social determinants. It doesn't mean, of course, that there are other types of determinants, but when I enumerate the determinants, one component is going to be explicitly social. So that's kind of the, the obvious part. The second part, of this is, which is essential uh, in the way the literature is structured, is that the dependence of beliefs, preferences, and opportunities is typically taken to have a particular form, which is that it has complementarities, which roughly speaking means that the likelihood or the level of an action by one person, we think that an equilibrium is going to be increasing with respect to characteristics or behaviors of others. So to make all of that concrete, one it would be one thing to say that my decision whether or not to smoke cigarettes depends on whether my friends smoke. The operating assumption of much of this literature is the way that that occurs is via complementarity, which is just a fancy way of saying 
that if you looked at the uh, probability that I'm going to smoke, it's increasing in the amount of smoking of my, uh, of my friends. So that's going to be kind of, as I said, the first idea, which if you think about it, is going to have important implications for how, how behaviors are going to correlate within and across groups. So what do I mean by that? If we think through the, this, you get this very intuitive idea that when I specify uh, the behaviors of individuals and populations, and I combine that with some notion that there's uh, the type of interdependence we call complementarity, that actually produces a theory of group level inequalities. And the reason for that is that this very elementary description translates into a statement that there are factors that cause within group correlations in behaviors, in other words, similarities within groups, but those will be will coexist with potential differences across groups. So that becomes a, an essential idea in this literature. And one thing to keep in mind in thinking about these social approaches to inequality is much of what they're trying to explain at the end of the day are not just the, the distribution individual outcomes, but also the way in which uh, we see uh, differences in group outcomes. Okay. So the second proposition is that uh, if you think about the way that I described the first one, as I, I roughly said, individuals are embedded in social structures, in very vague and abstract about what the social structures are. Networks, they could be neighborhoods, they could be uh, predetermined, they could be categories such as ethnicity or gender, but whatever, whatever it is, people are in the categories and are in the social structure, and the social structure influences the way they think about the choices they make. Now, the second part of the theory, uh, of this broad theoretical template, is going to say that many group memberships evolve, evolve in response to the social interactions that occur. All right? In other words, that uh, if we think about some sets of social structures, they could be friendship networks, uh, in which somebody either is or is not my friend, or I could think of residential neighborhoods, which is the most common example, or another example would be schools, etc. That the fact that these social influences matter by also has an implication about the nature of the social structure. And so in particular, social interactions become an explanation for why we observe patterns of segregation at the levels that we do. And so if one were going to think through uh, the various uh, contexts in which people have social interactions, you know, be they neighborhoods or be they schools and the like, one of the you know, first order salient features of thinking of the quality as generated by these, by these social structures is they're segregated. And so basically what propositions one and two are, are putting on the table is the, again an intuitive idea, which is there's a co-evolution of what people do in response to social structure, and a co-evolution of social structure because of the fact that social structure matters with reference to uh, how people, uh, individual preferences, constraints, and beliefs. Okay. So if you put one and two together, you end up with a theory of persistent inequality. And so the way to think about that is if we were now to uh, to, to unpack these, this, this co-evolution of social influences and social structure. One of the reasons why one would have persistence of socioeconomic status between parents and children is that inequality amongst the parents creates mechanisms that segregate the kids, and once the children are segregated, be in terms of the schools they attend or the neighborhoods or the colleges they attend, the socioeconomic status of the parents is going to be associated with the socioeconomic character of the children. And so, roughly, in other words, what the membership theory broadly defined is going to argue is that not only do we get this co-evolution of outcomes because of social influences and so, uh, and via social structure and social structure because of the social influences, but in fact, that, that's an intertemporal relationship. And so persistent inequality emerges in these types of frameworks. So that's the very big picture uh, of what, what these types of models are, are, tr are trying to achieve. Now, in saying that, of course, it's not that it matters that there's some unified theory of social interactions and social structures. I think if one examines the, the formal economic theory as well as the, uh, the empirical work on these, uh, these phenomena, they tend to dichotomize. Some papers basically take as given 
a social structure and ask what the consequences are for inequality. Other papers ask how do we actually model the, uh, the emergence of particular social structures. Putting them together is pretty tricky business, and that's where part of the research frontier is. Now, in, these, in making these types of arguments, what I would like to emphasize is that this is an important way to uh, an effort to, uh, to integrate, to enrich the categories uh, or the, 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 cat the types of explanations that are used in economics to understand aspects. So uh, that's why, uh, and so the, what the membership's theory of inequality is trying to do is to organize thinking about inequality by focusing on the characteristics of group memberships and the way they feed into the, uh, the outcomes of individuals. All right. Now, what I want to claim, and I'll make some lofty claims about why this is a, a useful way to think about the world. Uh, the first one is that uh, it, this actually does represent a good faith effort uh, to integrate sociological ideas into economics. You know, economists are often accused of being imperialists. So we're uh, trying to apply economic models to uh, you know, every facet of human behavior. I think that in the case of the social interactions literature, uh, that, it, it, that it's more of a uh, uh, an effort to try to ex uh, to enhance the explanatory domain of the formal models in economics by enriching them with reference to social science more generally. And so this is really a case where ideas, many of the ideas in, in models are derivative from ideas in sociology. You know, I think that it, one useful perspective on where frontiers are in economics is that they do involve the breaking of disciplinary barriers. So if we were to ask, for example, about think about behavioral economics as a now uh, honored and uh, you know, very widely studied uh, set of ideas. But behavioral economics emerges because of an effort to take ideas from aspects of psychology in terms of the limits of cognition and so it's in what would seem to be mistakes relative to some baseline notion of homo economicus and enrich the modeling of individual behavior to account for and integrate this, uh, this greater realism in the nature of individual decision making. So that would be one example. A second example of uh, what I think represents a you know, again, powerful breaking down of barriers is the work that, I, that Flavio, I'm sure, talked about, which is the work that he's done with Jim Ekman, which has introduced uh, so, you know, uh, non-cognitive skills or socio-emotional uh, skills into the modeling of individual outcomes. And so if I think of the behavioral economics ideas having to do with something with reference to the limits of, of human cognition, the Cunha Heckman work, the general research program on early childhood investment, what is, fu is fundamental to that is a different type of uh, breaking down of the barriers between psychology and economics. In this case, integrating personality psychology and economics. If one thinks about social interactions models, and that would include social networks models, uh, as, a, 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 as one species of them, all of them once represent an effort to take ideas in the, the you know, traditionally associated with sociology, and to build them into the uh, into the large, uh, into the way that uh, that we, we we do formal theory. So that's kind of the first thing I want to put on the table is is what's essential in this, in this approach. The second thing I would emphasize is that the models typically exhibit certain baseline certain deviations from what I call very neoclassical uh, economic models. So what do I mean by that? If I were to say you do you know, the strange thing to have social, to have interactions in an economic model, you would laugh at me and say, of course not. The Arrow de Brule model of general equilibrium has interactions in it, and for any game theory model you can think of has interactions in it. What I want to say here is that the types of, of phenomena that are called social interactions typically are associated with deviations from the, uh, the Arrow de Brule type framework. In other words, what distinguishes the Arrow de Brew model as a model of social interactions from the types of models that I'm, I'm focused on in these lectures is that price does in the Arrow de Brew model constitutes sufficient statistics for how people interact. In other words, the only thing that matters in terms of other people's behaviors with reference to me, you know, in, the, in a com nice complete Marcus Arrow de Brew model, is how the choices of others affect the prices that I face. Mm -hmm. 
In contrast, social interactions literature does not have markets per se that are going to uh, uh, create prices that are sufficient statistics. Something more complicated is going to be going on. There's not a market for uh, me to compensate my friends to uh, to engage to work harder in school so that I work harder as well, uh, and so on and so forth. And so that's the sense in which it's not just a matter of, of saying, well, when I specify preferences or I specify constraints or I specify beliefs that I put some sort of factors in, the models themselves are going to take stances on the nature of the equilibrium that emerges from these types of social influences. And that's going to be part and parcel of what it means to do policy. The third thing I would emphasize is that, you know, I've already given a hint that these models are at some level, because they're, they're asking about the interactions of individuals, create descriptions of aggregate behaviors. If I want to understand why there are differences in fertility rates or marriage rates across educational categories or across ethnic groups, then I'm asking questions that are ultimately about aggregate behaviors. The logic of these models is going to be respectful, as we'll see, of the heterogeneity of individuals. In other words, if I make the argument that there's group-level differences in observed outcomes, those group-level differences are going to emerge from the interactions of people that are going to be very heterogeneous. Now, the reason I emphasize that is that even though these models can exhibit things such as poverty traps, they are not deterministic. And it's going to be a matter to, and, and this is, again, is kind of a, a key in thinking about modeling. One has to expect individual heterogeneity and avoid, uh, uh, you know, setting up models which is poverty traps so sort of that there's probably zero that children escape, et cetera. In other words, the logic of these models is going to amount to saying there's a population of individuals, they're going to be heterogeneous uh, with reference to various uh, dimensions that determine behaviors at the same time, the social interactions that link them together, and we'll ask questions about what sort of aggregate av what sort of averages emerge, or percentages of choices of one type versus the other. But those will always be against the background of heterogeneous individuals. So I've referred to social influence as social interactions. And I think that uh, you know that, that's obviously a very broad, uh, a broad description. The, the literature itself, uh, I, I, I think it's reasonable to say, has uh, four types of, uh, of interactions that are particularly important. Now, let me be clear: this is not Plato carving nature at the joints. In other words, there's many ways to try to organize uh, the, the substantive types of social interactions people talk about, but I think that these are at least useful categories. Uh, probably the most common category for social interactions is what, uh, what I'll call peer group effects. And what that means is that when one specifies how people make valuations of, of, of different behaviors, that in the models there's actually a psychological primitive of wanting to be similar to other people. So I mentioned cigarette smoking as a canonical example of an environment and social interactions, or I could mention non-marital fertility or uh, graduation from high school. So the binary choices I find personally a little easier to think about. In each case, uh, the social approaches to these phenomena would emphasize the choice of one individual is determined by some peer groups or some set of friends or peers that they are sensitive to. A reference to the logic of the model, that is taken as a, as, a, as, a, as a primitive. In other words, the assumption is that the psychology, so to speak, has the property that, um, that uh, the preferences uh, instantiate a desire to be similar to certain others. The second set of models uh, uh, focus on role model effects. At some level, we can think about role model effects as the intergenerational analog to uh, uh, peer group effects. Uh, so, but and I think about role models. They also are going to have to do with issues of identity, etc. Sort of work that Rachel Cranton and George Akerlof have done, and there the idea is going to be that I mean, you, know, you think about an individual's preferences or the way they, they think about the world, or the sort of whatever uh, employ, that there's something about the behavior of the uh, adults in a community that influences, that sort of defines uh, 
they have the sorts of people they wish to be like someone and so forth. And so, as I said, a separate dimension of social interactions literature will typically focus on role models as the, as the relevant characters of the social interactions. And that's different from contemporary interactions. A third example of social interactions models will have to do with social norms. In other words, the idea that uh, within, within social groups, uh, there are certain behaviors which will be stigmatized, other behaviors which will be admired, and so on and so forth. And so social norms models function somewhat differently than peer groups or role models. Uh, the sense in which that's true is it's one thing to say that I get more utility from the fact that my friends smoke as well. It's a different thing to say that I live in a community in which if I were to smoke, the typical person in the community, whether or not I know them, is going to uh, react negatively. And so social norm models are going to end up with having to think about the way in which communities not only uh, formulate uh, norms, and then we have to also think about the way in which individuals are treated when they violate norms. And so much of the social capital literature has been motivated by understanding how social structures can informally enforce social norms. And that's uh, you know, the classic example of that would be uh, James Coleman's uh, discussion of the city Jews in New York, which uh, within the, uh, the Diamond uh, District of New York in particular, it was a community in which individuals lend one another diamonds uh, without elaborate uh, 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 records as to exactly which diamonds are, are lent. And so what he would argue is that that's a community where the, the informal enforcement mechanism would be the stigmatizing anybody in the appropriate contract. And so that's an example of which social norms are uh, lead to a very trustworthy behavior without any formal legal institution. And so it's kind of a classic example. Now, a fourth example of, uh, of social interactions would really be, would be something such as social learning. And so the idea of social learning is no deeper than saying that the way in which I, uh, I form beliefs about the world is conditioned by the, uh, the social milieu in which I function. And so you can think about that at, at different levels. One idea would be uh, um, that I personally have very little interest in computers, and so if I need to buy a new, new, uh, a new notebook, I will ask my friends what do they recommend. Based on that, I'll make a choice. A different example would be that my decisions about uh, the benefits of things depend on what I observe in a broader community. But in each case, the idea is the information sets that uh, the information I have available is determined by the, the social environment in which I function. Now, I, there's certainly no claim that peer group effects, role models, norms, and learning are orthogonal uh, objects, but they are conceptually distinct. And depending on the context, you would model them differently. So let me now mention some of the examples uh, which are inequality related with social interaction. I've mentioned the first one, which is fertility. And uh, if one wants to understand uh, patterns of, uh, of economic success or failure in the United States and the transmission of parents to children, clearly you know, there's, it's, it's not a study of controversy. The, the timing and family structure associated with births has first order effects. And so if one wants to understand why there's substantial heterogeneity across different uh, divisions of the population with respect to the fertility rates it is uh, a, a standard explanation to consider how norms uh, and the like uh, uh, vary across groups. And so I think that that's that fertility is, as I said, it's really one of the standard examples which one thinks about. A second example would be education. In other words, if we want to understand the heterogeneity in high school graduation rates across communities or heterogeneity in college attendance and the like. Uh, one, one again would think about the role of peers, uh, uh, role models, and the information that's available to students. Let me mention as an example on education this extremely interesting paper by Caroline Hotsky and Christopher Avery that appeared in Brookings papers, I think in 2015, uh, which they basically uh, uh, proposed what's the what's called the undermatch hypothesis. So the uh, the Hotsky Avery. Uh, finding was the following. They got, essentially got the entire uh, universe of standardized test scores one year and discovered 
that there are an extremely large number of high test score, high grade, poor uh, high school seniors that are not applying to elite colleges. So the point of the paper was, among the many points of the paper, was was to ask the question, why is it that we they could identify large numbers of, of, of high school seniors that didn't seem to be taking advantage of educational opportunities that they would have access to? Uh, there was no disposition resolution of this question but the one that one of the things they found is that that if somebody grew up near a college they're much less likely to not apply to elite schools and so the point is that the exposure to a college campus or to a college community itself has a consequence in how individuals think about the world so just a little example of social a third example in which social interactions have, have been studied actually quite extensively is employment and there, there's a, a long-standing, rich literature on social networks and employment. So the sort of stylized fact you will hear is that uh, that a significant fraction of individuals, 40 50 percent, depending on what paper you read, uh, when they take a job, they know somebody at the place that they took the job. Now, as it happens for uh, professors of economics, that number is probably 100 percent. So we have to, you know, the interpretation issue as to why it is that so many people take jobs at places where they know one of the uh, current workers. And the standard, uh, and so the explanation of interest to us is the fact that information, uh, that information about job opportunities flows across social networks. So the capacity of individuals to successfully match in, uh, match in labor markets is consequently influenced by whether or not they know individuals that uh, are, uh, are currently employed in certain places. So that literature is long-standing, and, uh, and I think the, the empirical evidence is really quite strong. Example number four is health, and I've already uh, mentioned uh, the, the obvious example. If somebody were asked the question, what is the leading preventable illness, uh, or what are the leading preventable causes of illness in the United States, Number one on the list probably is cigarette smoking. And so understanding the, um, the patterns of cigarette smoking uh, <clears throat> dynamics is just a first order case in which uh, pure effects are, have, have been, uh, I think, credibly identified. Uh, and so I could obviously extend uh, uh, cigarette smoking to thinking about uh, the use of drugs, use of alcohol, et cetera, all of which would have some, have some social component. The final example I wanted to mention, because I think it is under study, is language. And so maybe the background that I would, I would, would on this is to ask the following question, and that is, is can I identify a, a, a version of English which is completely comprehensible to all Americans, but nevertheless, if an individual uses it, hurts them on the labor market? And the answer is yes, and, the, and that would be African-American vernacular English or or black English. So the serious point I want to put on the table is uh, very interesting work that has shown how in things such as job interviews, the assessment of candidates is affected by the particular type of English that an individual uses. And I emphasize as well that that's a case where it has nothing to do with communication. It's perfectly understandable. Extremely minor differences in pronunciation and syntax. Now, they would have large effects on labor market outcomes. And so I put that on the table as an example, where if I wanted to have a model in terms of, of two phenomena, one of the use of uh, what I'll call you know, my, my version of English versus AAVE, uh, that I would want to, I need to have a model in which I was linking one English choice to individual identity. And that's exactly what was done in the sociolinguistics literature. Similarly, if I wanted to have a model of what's called code switching, in other words, switching between dialects, I would need to have a model in which I accounted for the social influences. And so I, I put this on the table as I think this is actually quite an interesting phenomenon to study. It's understudied in the American case, I think, with reference uh, most prominently to the black English. There's also evidence of discrimination uh, uh, with reference to uh, accents of people from Appalachia. That's much less studied. But I think that the, the message from the sociolinguistics literature, from history, whatever you want to say, is that language is extraordinarily alienating. And so understanding certain types of group inequalities, this strikes me as quite important. And certainly, uh, 
you know, trying to understand assimilation of immigrants to Europe, the issues of, of language acquisition are, are our first order. So again, these are obviously not exhaustive. I could put another uh, 20 phenomena up, which represent cases where we, there's credibly or plausibly uh, social influences and they're associated with inequality. Uh, as I said, kind of the first four are very standard economics. I think number five is, is, uh, is understudied and, uh, and, and quite important. Now, I make reference to things like social structures, groups, and there the literature is really uh, is pretty vast. And, and if, I don't know, the, the categories I listed are, uh, here are inadequate. I forgot the first group. It's called, what I mean by that is that if I were to trace out the dynamics of the memberships theory, I want to have some how memberships affect inequality. One way to think about it is individuals pass through groups at different stages of life. And so the first group a person is a member of is trivially their family. And so if I wanted to have, think about the dynamics of inequality as associated with parents, of course, one thing I would do is model the process by which parents influence children. Exactly what is done in human capital and skills models. But a second question I would ask on the family are the patterns of marriage and, re and reproduction. And so, in other words, the kind of the first one of the first questions for inequality is understanding to what extent, for example, there's a sort of mating by education or income or ethnicity. And so, I, as I said, I'm going to put down the endogenous groups, in other words, groups that form. And they have a theory of their formation, and we want to understand fully their consequences for inequality. And the first thing that one would actually start is the family, because the process and the, the, the actual degree of a sort of mating by education, by income, the degrees of segregation of, of marriage by ethnic group, all of those are going to say something about the dynamics of inequality, both of the individual and the group line. And so if we take kind of this metaphor of thinking about individuals evolving across the life course and having different group memberships, the second membership that one would focus on uh, would, be would be residential neighborhoods. And so again, the social interactions literature has been very focused on understanding how neighborhoods affect individuals. Neighborhoods are going to be the carriers of information. In other words, I made some reference to uh, friends telling you about jobs. Much of that work is going to focus on whether uh, on, on, on geographic constant that influences the, uh, on individuals. Another, well, obviously, would be peer effects in a, in a, in a community and you know, things such as stigma. A third, actually, I don't. These are not in the right order. The third example we would think about for individuals is schools. So, in other words, that sort of like, pass from the family to the residential neighborhood to the school. Once again, if we think about classroom peer effects uh, and the like, the ways in which individuals are assigned to schools, the extent to which schools are segregated by race, uh, by ethnicity, or by, by socioeconomic status, those are going to tell us something about the patterns of inequality in society. And the final category would be firms. This may sound like a, a less obvious social interaction, but if we think about the process by which individuals uh, uh, produce things, whatever, and, and, are, and are compensated, it becomes essential to know who one's co-workers are. In other words, uh, if we think about the firms themselves as loci of interactions, then an economy in which I have extremely high segregation of workers by skill across firms will have different inequality patterns than an economy in which there's greater heterogeneity across the world. And so to play that out a little bit, if you were to think about the distinction between uh, the paradigmatic American corporation of 1950 and the paradigmatic company of 2018, which I will, for the sake of argument, call General Motors and, uh, and Apple, one of the key features of the General Motors company did have a heterogeneous workforce. In other words, the managers, the accountants, the engineers and the blue collar workers were also part of the same production function. So there was, I'm obviously uh, oversimplifying the idea of bargaining issues. There was a sense, however, in which their prospects rose and fell together. In contrast, companies such as Apple have extremely <laughs> homogeneous workforces overall. In other words, this sort of information revolution uh, 
production functions that have emerged in the American economy actually have associated with them greater degrees because of the technology of skill segregation, and that by itself has some consequence for the income quality. So really what I want on the table is that we think from family to neighborhood, to school to firm, at each, at each stage, thinking about how an individual's characteristics translate into inequality, we have to think about how those groups around them form. Now, obviously not all social structures are going to have, uh, are going to be exogenous the way that I've described, and here would be examples of exogenous groups that have been studied. Ethnicity, gender, and religion. Now when I say exogenous, I do not mean they are literally exogenous, and there's no choice involved. It means something else, which is that from the perspective of constructing theoretical models and doing empirical work, one has to think about the endogeneity differently in the first category versus the second. In other words, the the, the implications of the uh, of the endogeneity in the first are, are very fundamental to any theoretical or empirical exercise. In the second case, it is more plausible to sort of take things as given and ask what the consequences are. But I don't want to draw you know, a bright yellow line between, uh, between the two. Now, in saying that, couple of things. Uh, the first is that when I talk about groups, that type of language is itself an, uh, a, a, a coarsening of actual social structure. What I mean by that is that it is the, it is the case when we think through uh, these uh, this models of neighborhood formation, for example, we actually may be losing something if we don't account for the richness of social networks within those groups. That's just a fancy way of saying that there's intensities that matter in various types of social interactions. So, you know, if I were to say you, I have a model, for example, class, the effects of classrooms on, on kids. The canonical way to do that would be to say that I, I look at a given child in the classroom, and that child is influenced by the average behavior of other kids, or it's influenced by the average income of the parents of other children. But of course, uh, a better model would be one that respected that within a classroom, there's this whole set of social relationships called friendships, and that they're going to have different intensities, and therefore the consequences of those types of, uh, of influence I referred to are going to be mediated by these. Now, there are answers to how to handle that, and if you look at the formal literature, what one now sees is a move away from crude formulations of how groups affect people, where people react to the average or some other base, some other statistic, actually thinking about sociomatrices, which are a fancy way of saying you think about a population of individuals and there's pictorialized weights that represent the intensity of the social relations. And again, I think I would put that on the frontier of, uh, of work in both. And the econometrics has been implemented uh, to be honest, primarily by, uh, uh, by, by two econometricians. Uh, not that much work has been done in theory. The second observation I would make is that the literature so far does not have a good theory about the salience of particular groups. What I mean by that is, you, is that the, the research in, in economics typically sort of takes as given, this is the group that it, I'm interested in knowing how classrooms affect people, how gender affects individuals how ethnicity does, how residential neighborhoods do it. And we don't really, at this point, I think, have good explanations as to why particular groups are, are salient versus others. So, uh, you know, as, I, as I often said, I'm just surprised that the group of bald economists doesn't have more solidarity, in a, or the group of, of hazel-eyed people. The serious point is that if I have a population, there are all these ways I can think about them potentially being divided. And, and we have to and understanding why certain divisions are salient. In other words, influence in uh, individuals is uh, is not fully worked out. I think obviously part of the answer to that is is, is historical. Yeah, that word is it's after because of the historical contingency. All right, so that's what I wanted to say at a very high level. What I want to do now is comment a bit about the nature of economic theory, social interactions. 
And what I mean by that is that I want to just sort of describe ways to think about the, the textbook model of choice that you've also. Uh, what do I mean by that? I mean, what I mean by that is I want really to, to open up an introductory economics book. And so I'm going to make it not quite an introductory book. I want it to be an introductory book where uh, the model that we study is actually useful in econometrics. So what do I mean by that? What I mean is that I want to, as a philosophical perspective, which you'll see in the lecture notes as you read through them, I, I want to write down math for a theoretical models that have the property that I could directly take them to data. In other words, a written a form that gives you a okay, So that's the kind of the heuristic background. So what I would say is that kind of the, you know, the textbook model would is very simple. Let's say that individuals have choices. I'm going to call the individual choice omega. Uh, for person I. I, when I make a choice, it lives in some constraint set. There's some set of possible things I can do. If my choice is smoking cigarettes, is it, it does the number zero one or one and minus one minus one if I smoke, one if I don't. If I'm buying stuff, that'll be my budget set. But whatever it is, there's some, there's some limits to what I can choose. And then I think about the individual as having uh, two types of characteristics. One of them I'm going to call observable individual characteristics. And that corresponds to the idea that if we do empirical work to study how individuals make choices, I have control variables. I want to predict if somebody goes to college, I might know, for example, the, in the in income level of the person's parents, or I might know the education level of the parents, so on and so forth. And the other thing I want to say is that individuals will have unobservable individual characteristics, which you've all seen, of course, but that's nothing more than the errors in a regression. The interpretation here is there's unobserved heterogeneity across individuals. It's unobserved to the modeler, but not, but not to the individuals themselves. All right, saying all that says that when I have data on, on ch choices, in other words, you give me the omegas, the way that I interpret them is that each omega is maximizing a payoff function B, which is a function of the choice itself, the characteristics of the individual, both observable and unobservable, subject to the fact that the choice has to choice set is determined by the characteristics of the individual. And to be clear, this is a tautology. There's no theory. That, there's no sense in which this is falsifiable. It merely says the way that economists we model choices is we do, we define them as maximizing something subject to a constraint set. But all I want to say here is that in what is the kind of the textbook model of choice. We think about the individual heterogeneity is manifested along some set of variables we would control for in principle if we were doing empirical work and the stuff we can't control for, and hence the art of doing econometrics is how to, how to account for the presence of the epsilon if we can't observe it. Now, contrast that to what I'm going to call the social interactions approach. And in the social interactions approach, following my group logic, what I would do is to start off by saying that when I have a group of individuals and I'm trying to explain, describe their model, their behavior, I would treat each individual as a member of some group. It's going to overlap in this case, they may not, so, but it's going to be very general in that case. What I would say is that groups have two things about them. One thing is a group has observable character, has characteristics. Okay. And by that, is that if you tell me that I live in this neighborhood, there's things you can measure about the neighborhood. You can tell me about the average income in the neighborhood, tell me about the variance of the income in the neighborhood, something about the distribution of educational levels. The second thing you would tell me, in principle, is what other people in the group are doing. And the way I want to think about that is that if I'm, I'm agent I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to care what other people in the group do. Now, a way of saying, so the question is, how do I describe what other people in the group do? Well, the way to do that is I would say that I have some beliefs about what they're going to do. And so that's why I have this, in, this notation omega minus i. If I'm i, the set of choices of everybody else is going to be the vector minus i. So what I want to say is that a way to summarize the fact, the behavior of others, is to say that I have beliefs about them. Now, again, this is very vague. If I know what they're doing, I have beliefs that are perfect foresight. If I have rational expectations, I have some model consistent way of forming beliefs about people. But whatever it is, 
I can say I have beliefs about it. All right, so, but the point of doing it all that way is that if I were to describe what does it mean for people to make choices in a world with social influences, I would once again say, as a tautology, choices that I observe, the omegas, the little omegas, they're defined as maximizing a payoff function or utility function. In this case, of course, it depends on the choice just like before. It depends on my heterogeneity, X, just as before. It depends on my epsilon just as before, but now it depends on the characteristics of the group Y and what I think other people are doing, which is that subjective probability measurement group. So in other words, if we think about the distinction between the modeling of individual choice and what I'm saying is in the introductory econ textbook versus the social interactions literature, there's a certain sense in which the modification is trivial. It simply adds the vector y and the function mu. In words, it says that when I'm thinking about modeling preferences and constraints, I have and beliefs. I have to. I'm simply going to expand the, the, the set of variables that I've embedded in those functions. Now, one reason I want to go through this is that well, you know what? There's really nothing. nothing Son, is that there is a tendency in some of this work to claim that that writing down models of, of, of individual agents and building in interaction structures somehow some new type of social science or some challenge that you can. We often see this in the literature on so-called agent-based models. I, I want to say about agent-based models is they, they, there's not a sense in which they are actually a different type of economic theory. Just like these models, just like neoclassical models, all have the same logic. You specify the, the trinity for the individuals, and, you, and from that you drive a rule of how they behave. In interactive environments, the rules and individual behavior are interdependent. And so the system's evolution, its properties might be complicated. You might have to run computer simulations to analyze it because you can't solve the, uh, the systems analytically, but they all have the same concept, uh, logical structure. And so I, I, I emphasize that because I think this literature has been subject to an unhealthy amount of overclaiming. And, uh, and so I want to push back a little bit. So what I want to say is at a very abstract level, these models will exhibit some properties that are interesting. The first property of these models is that they can exhibit multiple equilibrium. In other words, if I specify how individuals make decisions, that will not tell me what the group collectively does. And that's all I mean by multiple equilibrium. So make, let me make that concrete. If I'm in a community, all right, let's say I'm looking at a group of, of, of kids, and, I, I, and if you say to me, each one of them is going to make a decision, smoke, not smoke. If I were to know, and, and, I, and I told you that the behaviors are highly interdependent. In other words, the, I'm very likely to smoke, or if my friends smoke, I'm very unlikely to smoke otherwise. If I think about the world that way, there's an implication to it that's very interesting, which is it may the two groups of individuals that have identical characteristics would exhibit different behaviors. The reasons, again, are very intuitive, and you know this from coordination yet. If I have two identical groups on all characteristics that, that matter, in one group, everybody may smoke, and that's an equilibrium because if all the friends are smoking, each person finds it uh, preferable to smoke. A second group, nobody smokes. That's reinforced. Because once nobody's smoking, nobody has an incentive to smoke because the payoffs between the two favor not smoking. All right. So you know, you know, so multiple delivery you've seen in the game theory models, like coordination models, that the logic of them will reemerge throughout the social interactions literature. And the reason for that is complementarity. In other words, what complementarity says as a, at a, you know, at a conceptual level is the relative payoff to doing something is higher if other people do it. Well, if the sensitivity of my choices to others is sufficiently strong, then these models will generically create <laughs> multiple equilibrium. And so that tells us something very important, well, one of them, of course, is that microeconomics does not equal macroeconomics. Knowing the characteristics of individuals does not tell me about the characteristics of the outcomes of the groups. 
The second thing is it tells us that a source of inequality across groups can be that they're at different equilibrium. That's, that's kind of, I think, an underexplored, but uh, theoretical, let's say empirically underexplored implication of these models. The second theoretical, so that, that's kind of one big idea. So a lot of the literature is saying, yeah, this, this population, this group of people exhibit multiple equilibrium. A second idea in the model is that, that, these, that occurs quite general. Models exhibit social multipliers. So you all know the term, the Keynesian multiplier. And the idea of a social multiplier is to say that the relationship between individual incentives and social outcomes is multiplied by social influences. And so to see the intuition for this, think about the case where I take a high school and I were to offer a college scholarship to one student. So if I did that, then that student's incentive to graduate from high school and go to college would be increased, so I get some effect. Now if I take the same school and I simultaneously offer everybody the college scholarship, the equilibrium effect on graduation will be greater than simply scaling up uh, across everybody the individual effect when I only gave one scholarship. Why is that? Well, if I offer everybody scholarships, those people that react to them will influence their friends, who therefore are more likely to go to college, but if they're more likely to go to college, then they influence their friends, so on and so forth. And so just as the Keynesian multiplier had to do with this the lowers of demand, all the stuff you saw in your introductory economics class, if you set up a model which has social structure, once you start altering the individual incentives, they have spillover effects. Those spillover effects couple with each other and they will multiply, and so you will get this additional kick, as it were, from the change of the social influences. So, first property is multiple equilibria. The second property are what I call social multipliers. The third property is something called phase transition. What that means is that the models will exhibit, uh, well, it will exhibit special properties around certain parameters. It will exhibit threshold. Right? So let me translate that into something that's interpretable. If I asked you the following question, I, I said to you the following, there's something called water, this, uh, this substance. Does water exhibit a qualitative change in its property when I change the temperature from uh, minus to one degree centigrade to one degree centigrade? You would say, yes, something happens around zero. In other words, it moves from a liquid to a solid state. That's in, phys in nature, that's a phase transition. So if you thought about a parameter called temperature, there's a threshold effect around the uh, freezing point. That exact same property occurs in social models, in economics models. Roughly speaking, the number of equilibria depends on the strength of complementarity. And let's put it this way. If there's no complementarities, no interactions between people, the equilibrium is unique. If people are infinitely interdependent, in other words, the only utility I get is being the same as you, and I always get most of the equilibria. And if I then were to index the strength of complementarity between zero and infinity, what will happen is at some point, the number of equilibria will move from one to more than one, and that's exactly the same metaphorically as the move from ice to water. So in other words, when you write down, this is why you, you know, the advantage of writing down things formally, is when you, when you, you, you construct the actual mathematical structure of these environments, of the certain parameters that index phenomena of interest, the strength of complementarity, that would be an example of a parameter that's of interest. Another example of a parameter of interest would be the, the common incentive people have to do something. In other words, if there's college scholarships available and everybody has more of an incentive to go to college, that'll be another parameter of the model. A third parameter of the model would be how heterogeneous people are. In other words, are those epsilons cut tightly bunched or are they quite diffuse? What will happen in these more elaborate structures is there will be these transitions different qualitative properties of the model depending on the values of these parameters. And you'll have these locations in the space of the values of the parameters where if you just move them a little bit, the system behaves completely differently. And so that's the sort of thing we would be very interested in in thinking about models. 
And is there a concrete example of that? Let me at least put one on the table to think about. Many of you have probably heard of the Schelling model of residential segregation. So it's much Schelling's model of segregation. The question was, under what circumstances do preferences for people to be similar in ethnicity which generate completely segregated neighborhoods. And what Schelling's type models will do is they will demonstrate that there's a threshold effect. If there's sufficient preference, we start with integrated communities, you start to increase the preference for same group types, at some point the system will qualitatively change. And you can get complete segregation even if people have, even when people don't have vehement desire to, to be segregated. And so the tipping thing, um, and the Shelley model is exactly uh, the sort of, which has been, you know, struck empirically, the sort of thing that these theoretical models would explain. Okay. So those are kind of, as I said, kind of the things you look for in the model, in the theory. Do we get multiple equilibria? Do we get social multipliers? And do we get phase transition? A couple of comments I want to make are the following. One of them is these properties, have, actually it's a term of art in the, uh, in the applied mathematics literature, they're universal properties, which means when you write down one of these environments, there'll be many ways to permute the functions you use, the relationships, etc., get qualitatively the same, the same properties. So in other words, these are not functional form dependent in a way that makes them fragile, they're both pretty robust. The second thing to say is these models are extremely non -rated. And so I emphasize that because it is often the case that in, in, in empirical work, I don't think this is an unfair statement, that, that empirical work starts with linear specifications. And these types of models will, are, will indicate why, if the if the social interactions are powerful, linear models might not be the best way to, to look at the world because these nonlinearities simply may, will be hard to, hard to identify. All right, so that's what I wanted to say about theory. Let me now make some comments about uh, kind of what's empirical evidence. So what I mean by that is suppose that uh, I were in the docket and, uh, and you're the jury of economists and I somehow have to persuade you that, uh, that in doing economic theory or, doing, or in doing empirical economics you should include social factors. So what I would do as the, uh, as, as the lawyer in this case is I would give the evidence at different levels. What I mean by that is that I think that if one looks at the body of evidence, how would I sort of talk about social interactions? Uh, it, it, I don't think you should be surprised. I, I'm, I'm sure I could win the legal case. But I want to argue that the way that economists have marshaled evidence comes in, in very distinct areas. And I, the first one I'm going to call ethnography. And what I mean by that is that in modeling things such as behavior in neighborhoods and the like, a very important source of evidence are the qualitative studies, which are done by, you know, primarily by sociologists, psychologists, psychologists and, and other communities that do, this, that do this, in which one has thick qualitative descriptions of the ways in which individuals interact. So I just mentioned a couple of examples here. Uh, one is Elijah Anderson, who's written extensively based on observations in poor communities in Philadelphia. Uh, and then Mitchell Denier, who uh, has written about many different contexts in, uh, of, uh, again, in which he's embedded himself in communities and writes about the ways in which individuals interact. I think that this evidence is very powerful. Uh, I, I think that even though there's increasing uh, citation of it by economists, we've blown a lot of it as lip service. <laughs> in other words, uh, that. Uh, that much more should be done in terms of the sorts of, of using what's known to be identified in the ethnography literature in terms of making substantive assumptions in formal models. So to play this out and make it concrete, my own reading of the Denier work, just such as Slim's tables, so yes, you should know, it does. Uh, Mitchell Denier was a graduate student at the University of Chicago, and there was a, uh, a cafe that he would, he would go to, or a, a restaurant, and uh, which had a uh, you know, primarily African-American and not very affluent uh, clientele. And what he did was he went there and talked. I, mean, I know that's I'm trivialized that. He went there to basically understand this community of individuals. And what he was able to do was to construct a very rich description 
of the lives and interactions of, the, of this one community. And so, I, again, so speaking for myself, I was very moved by that to have to rethink about the way that I modeled heterogeneity in, in models of neighborhood effects in the land. Because what the Denier work revealed was that many of the deterministic or you know, not, uh, ways that I, one might model these things is, is missing fundamental richness. Now, maybe this is stuff I should have known or not, but the point is that that's exactly how one wants to read the literature. Similarly, Elijah Anderson's work is extremely clear if one's wanting to understand the social determinants of violence in poor communities. But if, if, if I were to actually write down models to explain it, one of the things I would have to deal with is the issue of both personal identity and the way that individuals in dangerous neighborhoods signal to one another. In other words, there are certain types of behavioral behaviors of children because they will decrease the probability that I'm a victim of violence. But in turn, that could actually, if everybody does the same thing, end up in a bad equilibrium. So what I really want on the table, in other words, this is maybe the most important piece of advice that we give young economists or interested in social interactions, is read outside of economics. So ethnography is really a, is a perfect example of a context in which I think the ability to write, write uh, insightful, formal theoretical models is deeply enhanced by, by understanding what the qualitative uh, literature gives us, because it will always be richer and, and more nuanced than the, uh, than the mathematics uh, of, the, of the formal theory. So the second source of evidence, uh, which I, I want to mention at, at several levels, is really going to be psych psychology. So within economics, there's a you know, you know, uh, you know very successful literature in experimental economics, which can identify social influences. I guess here I just wanted to mention where it's critical to read outside of economics per se, because of the fact, in particular, the social psychology literature is replete with, uh, with classic experiments that are extremely insightful as to how we would model the nature of the interdependences of preferences, beliefs, etc. So I'll just give you two examples. One is the so-called Robbers Cave experiment, which was done, I believe, in the 1950s by a social psychologist named Sharif. And what, in essence, was done was a group of, uh, of teenage boys were brought to Robbers Cave National Park in Oklahoma and their behaviors were studied. Now, what the experimenters were, did was, first they had the kids essentially interact in a certain way. They were assigned to some cabins. They played games, this, that, and the other thing. And then at some point, what the uh, experimenters did is they split up the, uh, the kids in the following sense, which is they, put, they broke up friendships so that uh, friends lived in different cabins. And they told one of the cabins that their name from now on was Eagles. The second cabin was called the Rattlers like rattlesnakes, and then they had the games become competitive between the eagles and the rat. Okay, so that's the background. Anybody with me? Now, what they then discovered was the following. If you ask the eagles about the rattlers after a while, they told them the rattlers are not very they're stupid and they're dishonest. So in other words, it turned out that uh, miraculously the uh, psychologists had put all the bad kids in one of the cabins. So, and, and, and so the eagles identified the rattlers as the bad kids. But of course, if you would ask the rattlers, they said the eagles were, were, were unintelligent and they were cheats. So the serious point is that this type of experiment tells us something very important and is an example of how uh, arbitrary labels can create stereotypes. And so if one wants to think about models of statistical discrimination and like, this is the sort of thing that helps motivate the way we would do the model. Okay, a second example would be the obedience to authority experiments in which one is trying to identify when a, so the background of that was, this was kind of, you know, I guess in the late 1950s, the psychologist Stanley Milgram wanted to see if, uh, uh, when people would obey, obey an authority figure. So basically, you know, undergraduates were asked to participate in the experiment where they would uh, turn the dialogue for a, uh, a researcher, and the researcher, so obviously the experiments are fake, so there's somebody who's wired up to an electric generator, and the, the kids were told that um, what the experiment's supposed to do was identify whether or not uh, certain types of supply could, re could revive memories. So 
operation where the kids were told, give elective shots to somebody to see if they remember something. So the trick was the following, and that is that the, the authority figure would tell the, 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 the college to keep turning the dial up even when the person who was getting the fake shock started to say that they're getting sick, they have a heart condition, it's dangerous, so on and so forth. And so that's the background of the experiment. The famous result is that two-thirds of the Yale students uh, all turned to the maximum. Uh, what's less remembered from the study is it turned out that changing the social environment completely changed the results. So in other words, if once it was in isolation, was told by the authority figure to turn the dial up, you got one outcome. In contrast, if you were to say to the students, you actually, or you had two students in there, one of them was in on the experiment, one wasn't. If the first student refused to turn the dial up, then the second student was willing to do it. So in other words, the message there is the configuration of social interactions is essential to understanding what the equilibrium is. I put those on the table as ex because the evidence is extraordinarily persuasive. In some cases, uh, it has to be extraordinarily persuasive uh, in a permanent sense because these, would, these experiments would never be approved. These things are really quite cruel to the <laughs> people who participate. But they're, uh, again, they're extremely powerful. So the third sort of, so the, so the first two were really my. My effort to say that I think that in construct doing working in this literature it really is essential to focus on, uh, on 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 areas of research work that's done outside of economics because there's going to be qualitative and experimental evidence that's very relevant to how we do formal modeling. The, the next two sources of information are things that are really closer to things that are much more uh, economic in terms of the fraction of people who have done them. And a lot of these have to do with what are called are so-called natural experiments. I think all of you know that if somebody says that they're going to do it, there's a natural experiment, it probably isn't very natural. And so uh, one of the things that's been studied extensively in economics are essentially programs that have changed who lives where. And so the most famous, one of the early examples of this is the so-called Gatro program. Uh, what happened was, so you may know that Chicago used to have uh, public housing in the middle of the city, in very bad, in very disadvantaged neighborhoods in the city, and these were very dangerous uh, structures. And so the, so the city of Chicago was, was sued uh, on the grounds they were discriminated against African Americans and poor people because of the concentration of the recipients of public housing in dangerous places. And we by the courts, as it was clear they were going to lose. What the Chicago did was it facilitated some families to move to, to suburbs outside of Chicago and people subsequently studied what happened to the families. And so the other part is that if you took, if you looked at families that were in these public housing projects and you compared those that moved to other parts of Chicago versus affluent suburbs, there were substantial differences in how individuals did. All right, and, and you will not be surprised that the families that moved outside the city, more affluent communities, they and their children had better socioeconomic the Gatro evidence is very interesting. The one problem with the Gatro evidence is that there's some data limitations. And that is, if I look at families that, so if I, if I look at some families, some were moved in Chicago, one of them moved, some were moved to suburbs, and I look 20 years later, one of the problems is I can't find the families that moved to the suburbs and moved back. And that's a classic self-selection. <laughs> what I want to make is the Gatro experiment even though the initial experiment was quite, was relatively clean, it was not perfect. But there's issues simply of how the families dynamically adapted and selected the communities. I mention that as a background because the most commonly cited source of evidence on neighborhood effects is another experiment called the Moving to Opportunity Demonstration. Essentially what happened is the Department of Housing and Urban Development decided to run the GATRO program uh, more like an experiment. So what it did, in essence, is it offered in five of, in, in five cities poor fam a random it, it, it chose poor, a group of poor families. Some were in control. Some were uh, given unrestricted housing vouchers. Others were given housing vouchers that required moving to a lower poverty. And so the families were tracked quite carefully. And so the consequences have been studied. 
The upshot there is the short-term effects seem to have been modest, though more recently, since the program was done uh, a number of years ago, it appears that the children that moved to lower poverty neighborhoods as adults did substantially better. And so this is an example, in other words, in which you have a program intervention, and you ask whether or not moving somebody to the more or less affluent neighborhood had on a consequence on it. So that's very powerful evidence about the program effect, the interpretation as to why it happened, you know, was what were the social influences. That's going to be what the limit is to that type of thing. The third example I'll give you is everybody's favorite institution, the U.S. Army. All right, so why do I mention that? Because I, I mean, because I actually think data from the military is very much underutilized by economists. And so why did I focus on the U.S. Army? If I asked you, name an institution in the United States that is unique in terms of the fraction of individuals in leadership positions that are African American, and it's an institution that has uh, substantial punishments for, for discriminatory behavior, the answer would be the Army. And so the background of this is that uh, because there are considerable concerns about racial uh, disharmony affecting fighting capability of the American Army in the, seven, in the late 60s and 70s. As a result, the Army changed many of its protocols for uh, dealing with, uh, with, with white and black soldiers. And those include things such as uh, uh, everything ranging from program, basically punishments for people that were uh, uh, involved in, in in serious punishment for discriminatory behavior, as well as targeted efforts to uh, try to improve the uh, promotion rate of non-commissioned officers. There's a whole host of things one could list. And so I don't, without, without, without sounding like a Pollyanna, they somehow miraculously solved it, all problems or punished all bad behavior. Nevertheless, the qualitative change, what I want to put on the table is that the work that's been done to study the attitudes on race on, and how societies work by people who have gone through the military, you know, both African Americans and whites, indicates that many of these attitudes have been qualitatively affected by being in the experience of the military, which had different rules for conduct. So Charles Moskos, who was a late sociologist in Northwestern, is the primary person to study this. We put this on the table because military forces spent a lot, the militaries of various countries spent an enormous amount of time figuring out how to get solidarity and work together. And those type of data are invaluable for trying to measure social interactions. Okay, so those are the three types of evidence that I think uh, are, uh, are uh, you know, those are examples of natural experiments. I did mention something, and that is the one has to be careful in their interpretation. One reason, of course, is endogeneity. Gatro and the Army both had selection on the treatment. So forth. The second point is that if treatment effects are often hard to decompose into mechanisms. An example, it turns out in the MTO, the Moving to Opportunity Program, one of the positive effects of moving families to lower poverty neighborhoods is the asthma rate of children went down. Now, one interpretation of that would be uh, the following. That is that asthma is associated with stress. And when children move to lower crime neighborhoods, there's less stress. In other words, exposure to, to gunfire, uh, to the threat of violence, all that is, is that's very well understood. You have terrible health effects on children in disadvantaged communities. And so one could argue there's a social interaction effect. In other words, the characteristics of the neighborhood affected the individuals. Here's the identification problem. Asthma is also associated with rat infestations. And so if it's the case that moving, by giving families vouchers to move to low-income neighborhoods, if the quality of their houses improves, that would also reduce asthma. And that's not a social effect. That's just a, a standard exposure effect. So that's not to say that these are not informative, but what you have to recognize is that these types of experiments often, at least the natural ones, not the laboratory ones, of course, are going to have limits in the ability to interpret them. Okay, so those are three sources of evidence. What's the last? You know it, you love it. It's called a regression. In other words, most, much of the work in economics is taking observational data and constructing that.
think about it from the perspective of a linear model. It's no deeper than saying, I have some outcome omega, I regress it against stuff that's individual specific, those are the x's, some stuff that's group specific, that's y, and to say that there's a social interaction effect or a neighborhood effect, for example, would be to say that d is statistically significant. Now, there's much more sophisticated models that have been used in the uh, in literature, but they all are kind of coming down to the same idea. I have a group of individuals. There's something of interest for me. They're omegas, whose variation I wish to explain. To say there's a social influence is to say that conditional on the individual heterogeneity of the X's, there's something at a group level that helps predict the differences in the omegas. So that's the thought experiment in the, in the, uh, in the statistical literature. So I think, uh, you know, fit, let me say, first of all, this literature is actually uh, now almost 36 years old. Uh, Linda uh, uh, Dasher Lowry is the probably the first person to actually run these types of regressions you do with the PSID. So there's, there's hundreds upon hundreds of papers that have found various measures of groups characteristics have correlative significance with outcomes of interest. I want to just make a couple of comments just to be, to be clear about where the literature is and what its limits are. The first thing is that, and this is a problem I think you know, quite generally, is that the empirical literature on social interactions, it has these variables that measure neighborhoods or variables that measure schools, and there isn't usually a principled theory as to what variables to use. So let me just play this out. If I asked you whether a residential neighborhood affects the uh, labor market outcomes of somebody, the right neighborhood you grow up in, but I could, you know, so one paper will look at the average income in the neighborhood. Another paper will look at the percentage of, of adults in the neighborhood that have white collar jobs. The third one will look at the percentage of families that are receiving public welfare. In other words, when we talk about social interactions, even if we have a beautiful, pristine mathematical model, it's translation into econometrics, an econometric framework requires making judgments about how to translate the theoretical constructs into measured variables. And that's a very understudied area, which is how, how to think about that mapping and how to develop robust empirical evidence when it is the case that something such as a peer effect or a role model effect doesn't tell us what variables necessarily mean. Next comment I want to make is that the empirical literature typically does not do a good job of focusing on the difference between whether the characteristics of people affect me or whether the behaviors of people affect me. In the literature, that's known as the distinction between contextual effects, that's the characteristics of others, versus the endogenous effects, which are the characteristics, or which are the behaviors of others. So in that sense, the empirical literature uh, is, is not strong on identifying mechanisms. I guess the third thing I want to say is to notice that the way this literature typically works is that it makes an assumption about the social structure and then asks if this is the social structure, does the social structure matter? So what do I mean by that? Somebody will run, if I run a regression that says that my outcome depends on the average behavior of my friends, that's assuming the social structure. It says I weight my friends equally. Again, a frontier in thinking about credible empirical evidence and social interactions is to weaken the assumptions that are made about the social structure. Now, there are ways to do that constructively, but that's, uh, you know, that's very, very, very new. Right. So, let me make a few comments now about identification. Because what, I, what I did in the previous slide is these are kind of the, the background, big picture issues. Basically, how do we identify uh, the appropriate empirical measures for social interactions not well defined? How do we distinguish between characteristics versus behaviors often not done and very little? And how do we not make excessively strong a priori assumptions about how much we know about social structure? Now, within the confines of the social interactions literature, there are kind of three classical, or three types of, uh, of identification problems. Okay, the first identification problem would be, suppose an individual is 
experience is more than one social influence. I disentangle the types of social As I said, that's a classic identification problem. Second idea would be self-selection. How do I account for the fact that the social structure is endogenous? The third example would be unobserved group level variables. And maybe that the epsilons, the stuff I left out, is correlated between individuals, and that somehow impedes identification. So let me talk through an example. So let's suppose I made the following observation. Here, here's the fact on the table. <coughs> Higher, higher the poverty rate in the neighborhood, the lower the probability a child will graduate from high school. Yeah, that's the fact. And it is a fact. The question is, how would I interpret it? Okay, everybody with me? Poverty associated with low education. Here's one explanation. I'm not, I'm not <laughs> saying any of these are empirically true, but they're, they're candidates. The one possibility would be that high poverty neighborhoods are disproportionately composed of people that have low labor market aspirations. In other words, they, in other words, this, they, and whatever the reason is, they just don't. They, their, their choices with reference to the labor market are different than others. Well, if those if those aspirations are transmitted from parents to children, and those are associated with education, then poor neighborhoods would have lower educational attainment. But the neighborhood's not, not the point. Merely, as the neighborhood is a configuration of parents who make similar choices with respect. to Okay, that sounds like a conservative stereo, you know, this is my way of stereotyping a conservative explanation to the, to the proper proposition. There's a liberal explanation. Okay. That is that families in high poverty neighborhoods are less likely to be able to finance college, and hence the opportunities for further education are lower for their kids. Once you do that, that diminishes the incentives to graduate. But notice it's the same property as the other and see, of course, and that's maybe why I want to say this whole political concept. Is I'm going to give you a left versus a right example, but what matters here is one reason why the characteristics of the neighborhood would correlate with the individuals is simply that there's a, that a neighborhood has similar types of people. Here's a third explanation, okay. one that I think you know we know has some truth, and that is that it may be that the quality of schools is lower in high poverty neighborhoods. Because we know something, which is teachers don't tend to not want to work in communities that are disadvantaged. So in the process of teacher assignment, that actually creates a, a diminution of educational quality in poor neighborhoods. Okay? Here's another one. All right. It could be that this is the explanation. In high poverty neighborhoods, there's a relatively high fraction of individuals who even if they graduated from high school. They didn't do well in labor markets. If that's true, then teenagers in the neighborhood will not see the full benefits of education because their experience will be that they observe people in which education does not have a strong payoff. Okay. Here's another one. Individuals might be affected by the distribution of types in the neighborhood. So if people have labor market aspirations that are lower in poor neighborhoods, then that gets picked up by the kids. It's not their parents, it's the community. Or if social networks create relationships that make the value of a high school education lower, then there'll be some relationship between the occupational structure. Mm -hmm. Here's the fi final one, and that is, it may be, then this one certainly empirically is most likely, uh, that teenagers in high poverty neighborhoods simply go to worse schools because the neighborhoods the school's social reasons are not uh, are, aren't that good. I've already mentioned one of them, which is the crime damages education. The other is poor neighborhoods, poor school districts have fewer resources for kids. And then the final one could be that there's just differences in the peer effects. It might be in one community that the uh, levels of educational attainment that are look more reinforcing and in another one, the, they're high. So this is what I'm trying to say. I gave you seven examples, explanations as to why we would observe as an empirical matter negative correlation between educational attainment and negative and, uh, and, and neighborhood poverty. Each one has a different causal mechanism. Notice this, and this is the point I wanted to. All right, explanations one and two 
That's all self-selection. There is no social interaction. In other words, the parents are different in poor neighborhoods. They're poor. That's what it means in poor neighborhood. And that's the parents' poverty that has some effect on the child. Explanation three, which was that poor neighborhoods have, have lower quality teachers, that's, a, that's just a group effect. It's not social. It's obviously something about the nature of the neighborhood. Explanations four, five, and six are what are called contextual effects. There's characteristics of the distribution of parents in a community, and that distribution affects the children. Explanation seven, there's a typo on the slide, I'm sorry, is an endogenous effect. It says that the interdependences of the kids uh, is creating different outcomes. So those are the identification problems. In other words, if you look at the formal econometric literature, the different types of identification problems have to do with disentangling the roles of self-selection, correlated heterogeneity, observed heterogeneity, and disentangling the different mechanisms. And that's in the formal literature, you know, maybe it's going to be mathematically messy, complicated, but it's all So the way I'd summarize the literature is I think you can challenge the empirical evidence, certainly. Uh, but uh, if anything, of these four categories of evidence, I think that uh, the statistical analysis are probably the least persuasive because of the difficulties of dealing with self-selection and correlating energy. All right, so I have uh, five minutes left, so let me briefly um, uh, say a few things about public things. I really want to say two things. First is that if you take the social interactions perspective seriously, in other words, I think that the for example, that income segregation has a first order effect in perpetuating inequality across generations, so on and so forth, that's going to have implications for how we think about public policy. I want to put two on the table. So the first, I want to call associational redistribution. What do I mean by that? What I mean is that if we think about the, you know, much discussion of anti poverty policies, it has to do with the redistribution of income. A universal basic income is you know, the flavor of, you know, is the one that's now received a lot of attention, but more classical ones would be, you know, the welfare programs. The thing that could be distributed in principle, redistributed, are associations. In other words, if we think social structure is mediating an important source of inequality, we can ask questions about what can be done to facilitate uh, changes in the social structure. Now, that's, that isn't Orwellian, because many policies, in fact, do that. Affirmative action policies, you know, which you know, promote diversity, be it socioeconomic or ethnic or gender or what have you, in either schools or firms, are examples of associational redistribution. Except for the, don't say anything deeper than it, what, here's a configuration of how individuals are, are assigned to groups, or, or in this case, schools or firms, we're going to have a different one. A different example of associated redistribution is what was, was busing for integration. This has largely died out in the United States, but there was a period of time where within school districts, schools were integrated by moving away from the neighborhood school model and moving kids around, around the schools. Another example, which is relevant today, is that charter schools and magnet schools have consequences for what types of kids interact with each other. So all I want to say is that if we, if we take things such as neighborhoods or schools in concrete as essential determinants of inequality, and then ask questions about the assignment rules to these organizations, and I can think about not redistributing income, but rather redistributing memberships. And there's, and there's not something bizarre about that because many public policies in fact do that. Okay. So here, I guess what I want to do is just you know, emphasize that in thinking about these uh, you know, kind of what the ethical claims are and what, what are going to be the concerns. The main thing I would say is that uh, the way that one justifies a social redistribution is really on the quality of opportunity. And so what I mean by that is that if you look at the, liter the philosophy literature on quality of opportunity, and I'm talking about John Romer and others, uh, what is going to be emphasized there is what I what a fair society does is it minimizes the role of factors for which people are not responsible in outcomes. Okay. And so what that means operationally is since you know, I'm not responsible for the neighborhood I grew up in or, or uh, you know, 
as an example, but that's not something that legitimately should be determining quality. And so since I'm running out of time, what I want to say is I want to through what it would mean to formalize the notion of the quality of opportunity. One approach to it is going to be that we are interested in minimizing the role of certain factors and clearly group memberships are factors people are not logically held responsible for, particularly children being held responsible for. All right. Now, there's other ethical claims that one can put on the table. You know, there are arguments in favor of meritocracy. Those are statements that basically say that even if people are not responsible for inequality, they may deserve some, some inequalities may arrive from dessert. So, as an example, I'm not responsible for the fact I can't win the 100 meters of the Olympics, but I don't therefore have any claim for a gold medal. So, in some contexts, we think that everything's driven by what you deserve. Because <coughs> we believe in self actualization and privacy. Nobody would argue in favor of, a, of associational redistribution for who marries who. They would make the argument in favor of who goes to school with them. So all I want to say on the, in putting this on the table is if one wants to work through the normative implications of, of associational redistribution, one would start with the quality of opportunity, then, would have, then one would have to think about the distinction between whether people are responsible for something versus conducts where they deserve something. And then finally, you have to think about privacy considerations or what I call self-actualization. All right, so let me skip these. And then the final comment I want to make is I think that it's worth thinking about the implications of social interactions for the nonlinear effects of policies. So here's the example I want to end this lecture with, which is suppose that these social interactions are really important and they induce enormous nonlinearities in behavior. If I have a fixed pool of money, uh, Suppose I have $100 million for college scholarship, a million dollars for college scholarships. What I could do is offer them equally to everybody in the city, all the high school seniors, or I could just offer them to one school. Are you with me? That's the thought. Suppose 100 kids are going to get the scholarships. Either it's 100 kids in the same school or 100 kids distributed across different schools in the city. Here's the problem. We normally would think it's fair to make sure every student is eligible for the scholarship, but if the effects are nonlinear, there's much more bang for buck if I concentrate. And so what I want to say is that I think that if one takes these nonlinear seriously, there are interesting equity and efficiency trade-offs. Okay, so this is where I want to leave things. I think that the theories of social interactions are actually pretty well developed. So there are rich models of conditional and social structure, what happens. There are rich models of how social structure emerges. The literature actually has to get closer there. Uh, I think the econometrics and uh, empirical work, they're making progress to the much more to do their identification. But I, I think that uh, the policy implications, because of the, Latin, the need to focus on redistribution of association, and, the, and what I'm going to call complications on the normative side, that's very much yet to be developed. Okay, so let me stop there, and, uh, and then I guess there's a break for five minutes, and then we'll go. Uh, we'll, 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 we'll. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, so I, I'm a little bit uh, unclear on what be efficient since I've covered 20% of what I wanted. 50% of the time, so let me, <laughs> so let, let me do the following. Uh, so of the five sets of lecture notes, with lecture, I'm going to skip two and three. What lecture notes two will do is we'll go in some detail, uh, it'll do three things. First, we'll talk about complementarity in some detail. Uh, second, it will go through some basic mathematics of statistical mechanics models. The reason for that is not because of our great love of physics, but because those models are essentially models that are of stochastic processes of, uh, of, of systems of interacting objects. And so if we think about a population of individuals, and there's some social structure, they're a system of interacting people, and there's mathematical analogies between the two. And as a result, uh, they can be useful both in economic theory and in econometrics. And then the third thing is done in those lecture notes is I go through a, uh, a set of discrete choice models that, that Buzz Brock and I developed, which use the statistical mechanics models uh, and the idea of complementarity and then work out uh, models of you know, things such as cigarette smoking you know, and the like.
all of which have those properties that I referred to. Now that's most social <laughs> multiplier, phase transition, multiple equilibrium. So you can sort of see how the uh, the techniques of the um, that, I, that I described at a very high level in the first lecture come into play. Lecture notes three are a set of notes on identification problems in social interactions models. And what they do is they go through basic social interactions models and sort of illustrate the canonical identification problems and then show how various modifications of the models uh, will either uh, eliminate the identification problems or uh, show that they prove to be robust. Uh, so I'll, I'll leave those just for reading. I thought it would be most useful to, uh, for me to actually, uh, in this half of the presentation, talk about two papers, or at least one paper, maybe two papers, that, uh, that will illustrate the applications and the techniques. Uh, so that's why I'm going to start with social interactions for identification. And this is actually going to be based on a paper that I wrote with Larry Bloom, Buzz Brock, and uh, Raji Jack Raman, uh, which is in the JPA 2015. Uh, what I want to do in the paper is to develop now in some detail the basic theory, the, the formal theory of social interactions models, and uh, as well as the identification results. Uh, I have the, the paper is is uh, not well written. <laughs> I don't say with false modesty. It was not. Uh, it, it's it's hard to read because it's very notation intensive. So. And the slides are also very notation intensive, but I will uh, basically just go through to try to give, give basic ideas. All right, so what I want to put on the table, in, in other words, is a, uh, a fully delineated model of social interactions, which will be constructed in a way that the theoretical model is automatically an economy. And what that will, and, you know, kind of the advantage of doing it that way is that there's no difference between doing theory and doing econometrics in terms of how to think about the underlying relationships. The disadvantage is that I'm going to make various assumptions that make a seamless relationship. What I want to communicate in the, uh, in the presentation then is both kind of how one does things from first principles as well as um, where I see the identification front. So what I want to do, what the paper is going to do is it's going to have five uh, five claims. Um, first is it's going to get the full micro foundations of, of linear social interactions models, and it'll do it in the Bayes-Nash framework. I certainly make clear there's many papers in economics that have linear models in them which have social structures, but this is nothing else will. Uh, uh, will, will, will unify the, the methodology so you sort of know where all the assumptions are. The second thing I want to do is to sort of unify uh, the, the various results that exist in the identification literature. So I, in, in one of the papers that was distributed for, for my lectures, it's called Identification of Social Interactions. And if, uh, if you take a look at that paper, one thing you can see you'll, you'll be is uh, may be overwhelmed that there are so many different results. And so what I want to do is sort of add what they have in common. Now, the third thing I want to do is sort of show you that, in fact, uh, contrary to uh, the folk wisdom in the literature, that, I did, that under, some, under certain information assumptions, we can identify certain interactions from the individual level data. And, uh, It'll be generic in a sense that I'll make mathematically precise. Uh, in contrast, what I'll say, then I want to talk about where I think the frontier is for social interactions and econometrics, kind of where, where methodology is needed. And I've alluded to that before, and that is that, uh, uh, the, that in trying to understand social interactions, I, the thought experiments typically make strong assumptions about what we know about social structure or the actions in my judgment. Is really a limited knowledge. And then the final thing I want to do is talk about the endogenous social structure. That'll be really endogenous. So, social interactions models, the way in some sense conceptualize them is that there's some population of individuals. And these individuals have, uh, have characteristics. Now, notice that in this same sphere of wanting to uh, to think about the relationship between econometrics and theory, I'm going to think of individuals as having characteristics X and Z. 
difference x's are going to be things that are observable and z's are things that are unobserved now in playing all of that out what i'm saying in other words is that i have a population of people and uh, suppose that what i want to do is predict their uh, their effort levels in school uh, what i would say is i know so i can observe something about them that is the family income and so i can't observe we should be this. All right. Now, in thinking about this environment, what I'm going to do is specify that people make choices. Those choices maximize expected utility because I'm going to have some limits to information. And I'm going to have to, if people don't know everything, you have to sort of ask what it is they don't know. And that'll be they don't see each other's needs. And as a result, they, uh, they have to have prior beliefs about. And that's just a fancy way of saying that when I think about this population of individuals interacting, I assume that I know some stuff about my classmates. That'll be I know their X's, but I don't know their Z's. Now, what's going to drive the model is the specification of, of preferences. Right? That's simply the utility function. And so this is going to, here's the thought experiment. An individual has a utility function u, and it depends on his or her choice omega i, and it depends on the choices of the other applicants omega minus. Now, keep in mind that what we want to do is we want to write down a theoretical system that will translate into an econometric model. And so, this is a reverse engineering exercise. In other words, all, you know, the great majority of empirical papers and social interactions focus on linear models, and so what I'm trying to do is reverse engineer to give you the linear model. So the linear model is going to have three pieces. Okay, the first part is going to be gamma, xi plus zi plus uh, delta, sum across j, cij, xj times omega i. So we see the first piece of that equation. What that is, is it's going to say that as you increase my omega, there's a linear change in my payoff that's that, is that compound term. The second term, which is uh, omega minus omega squared divided by 2, that's just the cost to, uh, to increase the choice term. The reason that we need to have that is I have to have a reason why everybody doesn't choose infinity. So in other words, the first two parts of the model are pretty simple. It basically says there's a, mar a linear marginal product for each individual. Uh, associated with omega and it's a convex cost. The third part, which is minus phi upon 2 omega i minus a certain sum squared, is going to be a conformity effect. So put differently, this model has embedded in it two types of social interactions. First type of social interaction, which is that sum across the C uh, xj term, is a contextual effect. The idea is if you're asking how productive I'm, or what's the marginal pay, marginal product of my doing something, it depends on the characteristics of the people I'm interacting with. It is common in the empirical literature and social interactions to assume that people react to the average of the characteristics of others. That's just the special case of the CIJ. It says they all equal uh, the same value, and it says one upon the number of people in the population. So that's one way to talk about social interaction. A second type of social interaction is this term minus phi upon 2, omega i minus sum squared. And that's, that's really a peer group effect or an endogenous effect. And that captures the idea of conformity. So the idea, so the way to, way to read this equation is I'm a member of a population. Everybody else in the population is going to make some choice omega j. And I construct a weighted average of those other choices, and I react to how much I'm different from them. So it might be I only I care about the average behavior of others, in which case this it looks like a, the more standard form of a conformity effect, which is that I I feel like I, a pe, I pe, I'm penalized the, by the square of my deviation from the average of others. But what's important is that that's not the only case that can exist. Here. But again, to emphasize, the first type of social interaction effect says I react to characteristics of others. And so I might react to things about the parents of my, of my friends. The second one is that I react to the behaviors of others, and that's the endogenous effect. 
Notice that in specifying those relationships, let me just jump back, the way we're thinking about them is to say that there's a population of people that I interact with. And I assign a weight CIJ to my interactions with each of those individuals. And then I assign for each individual another weight AIJ. And so what that means for the entire population <laughs> is that what I mean, what one means by social structure are the socio matrices capital A and capital C. So the jargon socio matrix just says that these are the pairwise interactions across people. So everybody in the population assigns to everybody else some weight with respect to their behavior and another weight with respect to their characteristics. So that's a pretty general way to think about social structure. The social structures you see in the empirical literature are much simpler. They usually assume that people just assign the average of behaviors of others. That's the thing they care about. But in fact, this is how you would think about intensities. And, uh, and so the sociomatrice, which is the idea that comes from sociology, is a very richer description of how individuals are. Let me note that even though that's, I, I sort of start by saying something that's uh, that there was a goal by Mark Jepper on the standard model. There is an important sense in which this is still a limited type of social interaction. If I say, for example, that each individual reacts to the deviation of his or her choice from the average, that's the same thing as saying that I react element by, by uh, individual by individual. Or again, jumping back, you see all of my interactions are pairwise. That's an important limitation because it doesn't deal with higher order types of social interactions. It might be, for example, that what matters is not just me and you, plus me and somebody else, plus me and somebody in the third person. There may be interactions in the triads. Me, you, and the third person may have interaction effects because of the being a, being a triad. Put that on the table because in the sociology literature, you see actually somewhat richer specifications in different contexts in which larger aggregations of individuals are considered to be key in understanding social structure. And I think of that as an area where economists uh, should, should, uh, should take ideas and think about ways to move beyond the pairwise interactions which drive the model I just described. So in other words, if I say to you that I have these parameters AIJ and CIJ, what I'm implicitly saying is the way to measure social structure is pair by pair. Everybody in the population, I think of, I can just think of them as forming lots of different dyads, and each dyad has some influence. But of course, there could be higher levels of aggregation as well. All right. So that's kind of the background. So this is a very simple utility function. And the assumption is no deeper than agents are going to maximize expected utility. So uh, that means first order condition, and that's going to give us our, our, our laws of motion. That's where it is. And so the way that I want to proceed is I want to describe some you know, restrictions on the model that are made in the interest of uh, developing the theory of the model. And there's going to be other assumptions made to develop the economy. Okay. So what I'm going to do for the theory is I'm going to make some technical assumptions. I'm going to assume that the parameter phi is positive. A and C are non-negative, which row sums to either 0 or 1. And the AIIs sum are zeros. All of that is uninteresting. Well, actually, I don't think the other thing is not big. To say that phi is non-negative says that either that, that individuals essentially exhibit conformity effects. It's not a matter that I want to behave differently from others. I either I'm indifferent to others or I want to behave more similarly. If that's what you get from the non-negativity of A and C and and uh, and the uh, assumption that phi is non-negative. That's actually substantively important because it means that this model is going to be focused on cases where people want to uh, have differing degrees of incentives to behave similarly. I think it's an interesting case uh, to try to extend models to cases where the context in which I want to be like some people but dissimilar from others. One 
That, that type of model is actually very, uh, is mathematically much more complicated. The reason for that is that when all of the incentives are positive in terms of wanting to co-vary with others positively, that ensures that there's pure strategy equilibrium. It's much more complicated when I want to behave differently. <laughs> Awesome. You're probably familiar with the matching penny game, mixed strategy, so on and so forth, and all those are just, you know, that's a simple example of the, of the complicated mathematical thing that happens here. Now, when I say to you that I'm going to assume that the rows sum to either 0 or 1, that's, that's actually a triviality. It simply says that, the, that I react to a weighted average to others. And I could write down exactly the same model where, they don't, where it's something else happens, it simply would be more mathematically cumbersome. The final thing that AII equals zero, that really is a normalization. It basically says that I don't, I don't give myself any credit from conforming to myself. So that's really a triviality. You know, assumption T2, the second moments exist, that basically, again, that, that's, that's for technical convenience because I'm going to compute expected utilities and I want the expected utilities to exist. Oh, that's just the description of the, uh, of and that is that uh, restrictions on the payoff function are going to, uh, the only substitute in the matters of the social interactions are positive. So how do we think about the model? Well, if I have n individuals, notice that each individual can be thought of the following way. If you want to, what is it that defines me? What defines me is my x, other x's that I interact with, so that's n plus my z. So in other words, there's n plus one things that determine my behavior. In other words, the distribution of the x's in the population, because I know all of them, and my z. So that's the mapping r n plus one to r. And so this is a fancy way of saying, if you tell me the stuff that defines my behavior, which is the set of x's and my z, that'll give me a behavior. That's what the map is. And so that's that, and that's the response function. Or that's going to be a, not a function. Now, the Bayes Nash equilibrium, this is what's this, this is now substance. The thought experiment is that I make choices taking as given the strategies of the other agents. So, in other words, I'm going to maximize my expected utility given the stuff I know. The stuff I know are the X's and my Z. And since I don't know the Z's of other people, that's why I need to have a prior. I have some beliefs about those Z's that lets me compute the expected value. So that's all very elementary. All right, so now here's a theorem. Assume that, okay, I have my normalizations, and blah, blah, blah. And, and, and we have this, the, the non-negativity assumption. What I can think of now is that there's a vector of best response functions. This capital F, this little f in the equation, that's just a vector. And the ith element of it is the best response function for agent i. So the vector of best response functions is going to take on this mathematical form. All right. Now, if you take a look at the form, it's going to be a function of the parameters of the utility function, or the parameters of the utility function. They are phi, gamma, and delta. It's going to depend on the socio matrices A and Z, and it's going to depend on the values of X and Z. All right, so there's some algebra there. The algebra is simply derived from you take the you, you, you take the expected value of this and you maximize it. That means you differentiate, and you and then you. Uh, you, re, you solve for omegas from the first order condition for maximization. And so after you do the algebra, you end up with this as a description of the best response functions for everybody. All right. So even though, and so because I had this nice quadratic functional form of the preferences, when you manipulate things, you end up with a functional form that says, given the x's and given the z's, these are the choices that of course, the choices depend on the x's, the z's, the uh, socio matrices, and the utility quantities. Now, the one thing that's weird here is this, this term mu of x and z. 
And here's the thing that you need to be careful. Even though I don't, I don't see the Z's of other people, it might be, if I know their X's, I know something about their Z's. So to make that concrete, if I said that a person's choice depends on their desire to conform to other people, plus it depends on their family income, and it depends on their ambition, it might be the case, even though I can't see their ambition, I can draw an inference about their ambition from knowing their family income. So you have this so-called issue of higher order beliefs, which says that in some cases, you'll get this new term, new exism. But for our purposes, what I want you to see is two things. Number one, under the assumptions I made, there's always an equilibrium. That's uh, not a surprise. The second thing, which is a slight, I don't, I don't know if it's a surprise or not, is the equilibrium is always unique. Now, and the third thing is that depending on the relationship between X and Z, you may get this, this new, uh, new thing. I know is a very uh, mathematically precise object. In other words, the higher order beliefs term. The reason I said that the uh, it may be a surprise that the base Nash equilibrium is unique is that uh, I talked about before why complementarity might induce multiple equilibrium. Now, in the case of linear models, that actually is ruled out. The reason for that is that linear models, in a certain sense, are very, in a mathematically precise sense, I should say, are very restrictive in terms of the number of equilibrium. If we think about multiple equilibria, what we would like is two finite values, multiple finite values of choices that are consistent with the same model. Roughly speaking, the problem is that if you have a linear model, I think about a line intersecting the 45 degree, you can only hit it in one place. It's only nonlinear functions that can intersect the 45 degree line in more than one place. Why do I make a big deal about the 45 degree line? Well, if two people are identical, let's say there's multiple equilibrium, there's two choices they would each make that are internally self-consistent. And so I thought about my best response function as a function of what you do, the Bayes-Nash equilibrium in this case would be the intersection of my best response function at 45 degree. If it's linear, it can only hit in one place. And so all that is to say that there's a certain sense uh, in which the theoretical models are really not that interesting. At least as a piece of theory, it doesn't mean they're not relevant empirically or useful uh, in thinking about the world, but the one thing they can't do is produce multiple. That's it. So basically, maybe the first message is if you want to have work with linear models of social interaction, this is how to justify it. In other words, that if you're going to take a linear model of social interactions approach, you will have implicitly made certain assumptions about the nature of the uh, of the preference of individuals and in the way that you, the type of functions you're working with, you're going to then end up with an environment that has certain restrictions on uh, equilibria, uh, additive separability, so on. Now, before I go on, I'd like to compare this model to a different model. In the first model, the idea was that that the characteristics of other people affect my marginal product. That was one social interaction. And the second social interaction was that I, uh, I, I didn't want to deviate from the behavior. Here's a different model. The first two terms are the same as the first model, but the third term is different. The third term says that if other people do more, my marginal product is higher. Okay, so you see, B, B times the sum AIJ omega I omega J, what that says is if omega J is higher, the marginal product of omega being increased by the unit is higher. That's different from a conformity effect. In other words, a conformity effect says that there's a, some, some psychological primitive, uh, which, which says that, I, that I, I get disutility from being different from others. In this model, it's kind of a social increasing returns to scale, which says if others do something, it makes me more productive. The point I want to make is that if I were to analyze the second model, 
I would get the exact same equations as this one. In other words, the description of the equilibrium is the same for a model of conformity effects and a model of social increasing in terms of scale. That's an example of an identification problem. If people exhibit linearity in their behaviors in the way that I descri is described by this equation, I can't know whether or not they experience conformity effects or social increasing returns. Why is that true mathematically? Well, the reason is easy. And that is, more than one utility function can have the same first order condition. And that's literally what's happening here. You have two different functions you differentiate get the marginal cost equal to marginal benefit. And what's happened is you get the same solution for the first order. So that's just a hint as to why there are going to be identification problems in this literature. There'll be limits to what you can say about something. Okay. That's really what, all I wanted to say here about theory. And so just to repeat, what I wanted you to see was the the, the canonical models in empirical work, which are linear, they do have micro foundations. But those are micro foundations that are functional form specific and derived from a very particular framework. And they entail certain types and various types of restrictions. All right. Now, what I want to do is move from the theoretical model to an econometric model. And so the reason I want to do that is I now want to ask the question, what's identified? So if you think about what we have, I have some strong functional forms, but I also have some parameters. And the parameters come in two flavors. One set of parameters are actually the parameters of the utility function. One parameter was gamma. That was the marginal, that was the utility effect on me from changes in my x. A second utility parameter was delta. That was the effect on me of changes in the x's, the characteristics of other people. The third utility parameter was phi. That's how the behaviors of others affect me. So those sit here. And then the other set of parameters that we have to think about are the sociomatrices. Those are the intensities of the weights that link people. All right, so what these, these assumptions are going to do is they're basically, they're, they're not, again, they're not terribly interesting. What assumption, the first assumption says, if I was going to run a regression of my behavior and get the characteristics of everybody in the population, I should, I, it has to be the case that the characteristics of other people can't be linearly dependent. Otherwise, I couldn't, I, and the reason I want to rule that out is if I said to you that the X's in the regression are linearly dependent, you say the model's not identified. And so that's a trivial form of non-identification. All right. The other assumptions, E2, E3, E4, and E5, uh, they're not of terrible interest to us. What I mean by that is E2, and E3, E2, E3, and E5 are generalizations that you'll have to accept my word of honor that had you relaxed and the theorems would be exactly the same. <laughs> three times as long. All right, then assumption four is basically gets rid of correlation between the z's and the x's, and we'll rel I'll relax that. Okay. We have, and so the, the, really the point I'm trying to make is that we make some types of assumptions because we want to develop uh, theorems, pro propositions about the theoretical environment. I want to then ask whether or not the models from the theoretical environment other kind of properties that will typically make additional assumptions. That's what the E assumptions. Now the final thing I want to do is I'm going to give you something called a data assumption. And that is I'm going to assume that we can observe omega i and xi. What that means is the data are available at an individual level. This is a thing to think about in empirical work. And that is in some data sets, uh, such as the panel study of income dynamics, I would have individual level data, and I would have measures of things of the census tracts and characteristics of them, and I would have information about the families and you know, characteristics of the individuals. Other data sets, it's the only data I would have are things about, about the groups themselves. I may have data about precincts for voting, 
I may have data about crime rates in certain locations, et cetera, but I don't have individual level data. And so one has to work out separate conditions for identification, what can be learned, et cetera, the case where you have individual level data and group level. So, what's meant by identification? So, if you think about it, this, this model I've described says the following. It says that uh, the way that I would think about different, different models is they depend on the utility parameters gamma, delta, and phi, social matrices A and C, and the value of the prior order. Those are the things that control the model. Very low as you get to different behaviors. To say that the model is identified, really, and here I want to focus on the identification of gamma, delta, and phi, is to say that if it's the case that two different models generate the same data, they have to have the same values of gamma, delta, and phi. That's actually the stand, a version of the standard way that we think about identification every time. What do I mean by that? If I give you data, just when we ask the identification question, metaphorically, I assume I have infinite amounts of data. I get to an infinite number of times sample from the data generating process. From that, I get to generate all the moments of the data or all the joint distributions of the observables. Question is, are, is, there, is there more than one set of parameter values that could have generated the same joint distributions of the observable variables? What I'm asking here is, if I observe the omegas and the x's for everybody, under what circumstances is, does the joint distribution of the omegas and x's uniquely pin down gamma, delta, and phi? <laughs> so what I want to do is to say that, that, we want to, that that's really the thought experiment they have in mind. And that is that I have, to, I have two types of observables here. I have the characteristics of individuals, x's, and I have the omegas, the outcomes of the individuals, and I will associate with them the, the joint densities. And then I ask, is there, do the joint densities uniquely determine uh, or pin down what the values are of the primitives of the model, or should the utility parameters? Now, the answer to that question is going to be, it depends. And it's going to depend, everything is going to depend on A and What do I mean by that? One question is, if I know A and C, can I recover gamma, delta, and phi? That, the question put differently is, if I know the social structure, can I uncover the uh, the, the primitives of a model, the utility parameters. That is the conventional model, uh, qu conventional question in the econometrics literature. And that's what I meant. The econometrics literature says, here's the social structure, given the social structure, what's it? Here's a different question. I could say, I don't know the social structure. On the omegas and x's, and I don't know the social structure, what can I say about gamma, delta, and phi? Here's a third question. So one of them, I know everything about A and C. A second thing says, I don't know anything whatsoever about A and C outside the earlier normalizations. The third one could be, well, maybe I know something about A and C. Okay, so is everybody clear? That's the reason we sort of want to work through the three cases sequentially. All right, so let's do the, so, you know, it's kind of the style in econometrics to say, well, what's identified with very few assumptions? But here's a question. And that is, if it were the case that the only thing I have are the joint densities of X, X and omega, what is it I can identify? I don't know A and C. The answer is I can identify three things. First thing I can do is I can identify the matrix B. The matrix B is the reduced form projection of the omegas on the Xs. Okay? So in other words, I could always run a regression of my outcome 
on my behavior and everybody on my characteristics, excuse me, on my X and everybody else's X. I get some coefficients. Those would be my B's. The second thing I could recover is the constant term. In other words, I could add a constant term to the regression. That's mu of Z. And the third thing is I can get the sum of the two parameters, gamma and delta. The reason for that is that since I know the normalizations for A and C, that's the rope probability, that pins down the joint intensity of gamma and delta. Okay, that's, this is simply a fancy way of saying that, in a tri, uh, the saying that something is trivial. And that is the one thing I know I can get, I can generate from, from the data, are the projections of the omegas onto the x's. But remember, I want more than that. I want to know about the individual effect, which is gamma. I want to know about the contextual effect, which is delta. And I want to know about the endogenous effect, which is phi. And what the theorem says is that they are not identified. So is there an intuition to the theorem? And the answer is yes. If you think about the, the, this environment, I have I have n individuals. How many parameters am I, are unknown? Well, I, I admit gamma, delta, and phi, so that's three of them. But I'm also missing a and c. Now, a and c have some normalization. Remember, the diagonals are zero, and they're, they're row summable to one and zero. But even with those normalizations, Essentially, I have on order 2n squared unknowns. Each of the matrices is n by n, so they're n squared. If there's two of them, it's 2n squared. Subtract off 2n for the diagonal. That's the, number of, that's the number of unknown parameters. And so if I said to you I have n people and n squared plus 3, 2n squared minus 2n plus 3 parameters that are not identified, are not observed, you're not shocked that I can't identify them. Okay, so the message of this is no deep, is, is simple, which is with no prior knowledge of social structure, there are strong limits to what can be recovered. The one thing you can do is identify whether there's something social in the model. What do I mean by that? If I want to compare the prediction of my behavior given my x, the prediction of my behavior given my x and everybody else's x's, if those are not the same, then there's a reason why the other X is predicting. In this model, the only way that can happen is because there's a social influence. That's the good news. I can say something about social structure, but I can't tell you the reason. It might be because your X directly affects me, or it might be because your X indirectly affects me because it affects your, your behavior which affects me. And so what theorem two is doing, and again, the algebra is not important, the idea is important, is it's formalizing the limits to any statements about social influences when you don't actually observe the social structure. Okay, so that's, uh, I, I'm going to call that the negative result. Are there any questions on that? All right, so I want this as background. In other words, I think that this result is, uh, maybe it's useful, but it was useful to prove it, but I think it's, it, frankly, it's not a very surprising result. And it's for the reason that I said, that if I don't know, in some sense, the true, the, the set of unknown parameters are gamma, delta, and phi, capital A, the matrix A and the matrix C. So if one says that you can't, without knowledge of A and C, I can't pin down the other ones, that's just not a great surprise. They're simply, uh, uh, to, the, the model is oversaturating the parameters. So our goal now is to see, can we say something constructive? And so saying something constructive is going to have to do with introducing information about social structure and seeing how far that information goes. In doing that, I now want to be a little more careful in the relationship between the theoretical model 
and the sorts of models that appear in the literature. So what do I mean by that? If you look at the econometric literature on social interactions, I'm starting with you know, Matsky's very famous paper in 1993 on the reflection problem. What the literature actually does is it does not work with best response functions. It works with first order conditions. So what I mean by that is the typical, and this is, so what I'm going to do now is, is start with a model that will be like the Mansky model. So many of the models in the economics literature of social influences are based on what is called a linear in means model. So what does the linear in means model do? It says that people react to averages and the population can be partitioned into non-overlapping groups. So you say that in the so you give me a group of individuals, and I think of them as being in residential neighborhoods. You can only be in one neighborhood. You can't be in two. If you and I live in the same neighborhood, then I'm going to assign the same weight to everybody in the neighborhood. All right. Well, in other words, for everybody in my neighborhood, I assign one upon mg, mg the size of the neighborhood. And I assign one upon ng minus one. Remember, ai is zero if uh, we don't. Okay? If we, if we live in the same neighborhood, but if we live in different neighborhoods, there's no social interactions. The first order condition for this special case where I make these, normal, make these assumptions is that my behavior depends on, there's four terms here. It depends on my x, it depends on the average of the, of, of the x's in the group. That's the second term. It depends on the average of my beliefs about the choices of others. And it depends on my error. All right. So what do we know about this model? What we know is that if the groups are all the same size, the model is not identified. In other words, if every group same size that I can't tell whether my behavior is determined by the average of the behaviors of other people or the average of the characteristics of other people. That is what is called the reflection problem on this literature. Okay. The model that I refer to, the so-called the Mansky model, basically is the limit of this model when there's an infinite number of agents in the population. Mansky model is take n to infinity, so I, my behavior is determined by my x, just the average of the x's in the population, the average of the omegas, and my epsilon. Now, what's important is there's no n g's or n minus g minus ones. They, did, they, did, they, they disappear. Okay, and this model is known not to be identified. Right, so that's the kind of worry is I made some statements. What I said was, well, in this model, if groups have different sizes, one group's big, one group's little, the model is identified. If, one, if all the groups have the same size, it's not, they aren't identified. And if the groups are arbitrarily large, it's not identified. And so that's, a, and that's kind of, the, I'll say, an issue in the literature, which is that you go across different papers, and depending on the specification, the model either is identified or is not identified. Okay, we want to figure out why. One comment I want to make is the following, and that is, or I want to make two comments. The first comment is to notice that this model where identification fails, the reason it fails intuitively is x bar g and omega bar, the expected value of omega bar g, they're linearly, they're linearly This is the point, however, and that is that the model that I just described where identification fails, that is actually not the micro model. That's the large sample approximation of the micro model. And the point is that you cannot use approximations of models to study identification. So think about it this way. If I have a population of people and the groups have different sizes, the models identify. If I assume each group has an infinite size, that means that it's the same thing as saying the groups have the same size, and identification breaks down. Intuitively, 
identification is a, is a binary property. Either you are identified or you're not. And what you can, and so think about it this way. I could take the sequence of numbers one divided by k. As k goes to infinity, all of the numbers are positive, even though one divided by infinity, the large sample limit is zero. And so one of the messages to have in reading papers and identification is be very skeptical if for simplicity they take a large sample approximation, because it might hide something important. The same issue shows up in the literature on hedonic models, where the work by Eklund, Hesham, Neshan, excuse me, Eklund and Neshan showed that for various models of hedonic prices where identification failed, was, was believed to fail, it's because people took approximations of the model, the actual model of identification failed. Second comment I want to emphasize is the linear means model is conceptually a very, it's a strong assumption. It assumes that there's no heterogeneity in the intensities of interactions. The linear means model is still a very common model. Here's another very common model of social interactions. In this type of model, what happens is the people makes, uh, in essence, do the following. And that is, rather than just say, people are a priori, I know what groups they're in, what neighborhoods, and they react to the average, we actually get data on social networks. There are data sets that have asked questions such as who are your friends. The Ad Health data set goes into American High School. It's got, you know, it's a data set for American High Schools that does exactly that. And the point is that what that means is that you can do the following. You take a population of individuals. You ask each person who are you connected to, who are your friends. Then you assume that each individual assigns the same weight to everybody in their network. And they assign zeros to people that are outside the network. Now notice the two differences. First of all, networks can overlap. Neighborhoods can't overlap by definition. Either live here or I live here. On the other hand, if you're my friend and I'm somebody else's friend, that doesn't imply that the, 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 the third parties are friends with each other, right? So it's just a different what model. And unlike the linear and means model, it uses data to construct social structure. But notice it's a special type of social structure. It doesn't tell you the intensity of relationships. It just tells you whether they're zero or, or not. And that's a very important point. All right. So it turns out in these models, typically identification does work. So this is, the, this is where we are. The first thing is the following. That is, what I told you is we have a theorem that says, if I know nothing about social structure, identification fails. The second thing I've said to you is, well, there are all these different models of social interactions. This paper assumes this social structure. That paper assumes that social structure. Sometimes there's identification, sometimes there's not. We've got to figure out why. Why are different papers getting different answers? The third thing we have to do is to figure out, can, I shouldn't have said preference assumptions. I should have said weaker social structure assumptions. Sorry. In other words, where we are, as I've said to you, no knowledge of social structure. There's identification never holds. And I've said if you have complete knowledge of social structure, maybe it holds. We'd like to know if there's an intermediate. So this is how I want to proceed. So I want to do now. I want to consider. Th uh, you know, if you think about where we are, my first case was I didn't know A and C. My second case is I know A and C. And what I want to do now is I'm going to uh, uh, say the following, and that is I'm going to ask the question. Given A and C, can I identify the, the parameters, the individual effect, which was gamma, the contextual effect, which was delta, and the endogenous effect, which was... Right, here's the problem in answering that question. I know that for some of the values of A and C, identification fails. For other values of A and C, identification holds. 
But there's not going to be a theorem that says it always holds or it never holds. We know it sometimes yes, sometimes no. So now that means we have to think about the econometric question differently. The question I want to ask is, is identification common or is it uncommon? And I want to make that mathematically precise. So here's how we would do it. So this, again, okay, so the next set of slides are, are, are unreadable algebra, but this is going to be the idea. I want to say that there's all these different candidates for, pay, for social structure. Those are just different values of A and C. So think of a set of all the possible social structures for the models we've studied. Okay, since A is a matrix and C is a matrix, I can actually think of them as vectors. In other words, I can stack the columns of A on top of the columns of C, so there's going to be a big vector C. So what I have, in other words, is a set of vectors that describe the potential social structures that we observe. I want to divide the set of social structures into two categories, into two subsets two disjoint subsets. One subset are the cases where identification holds, and the other subset is the case where identification fails. Everybody with me? So I have all the possible social structures. I'm dividing them into the cases where identification holds and the cases where it fails. Now, what I want to know is whether the set where identification holds is it a higher dimension, equal dimension, or lower dimension than the set where identification doesn't hold? So think about it this way. Take the two-dimensional plane, R2, and suppose I divide it in half. The two subsets would have the same dimension, right? On the other hand, if I were to take the, 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 uh, the plane, R2, and I drew a line through it, the line is a lower dimension than the plane. So I would say that what we say is identification is generic if the set of social structures where identification holds is a higher dimension than the set where it does not hold. Metaphorically, I want to say that if, R, if, the, if, this, if the plane, R2, is all the models, if the cases where identification fails are aligned, then identification is non-generic. All right, so that's a much more mathematically sophisticated idea because this is this model identified that model. I want to characterize all the possible models. All right, so here's the big theorem. What the theorem is going to say is the following. That is, identification is generic. In other words, almost identification holds for almost every social structure. Okay, and so what I could do is go through a lot of complicated explanations, but this is what we want to know. Okay? Basically, the reason identification failed in the first model is there were too many parameters. We had eight, we had n squared parameters. Order n squared is only n people. It's just like a simultaneous equation system with no exclusion restrictions. On the other hand, if I know a and c, I go from, remember, 2n squared minus 2n plus 3 unknown parameters to 3 unknown parameters. In other words, I pinned down a priori almost every parameter that was unknown. And so the only cases where identification fails are when the system exhibits certain types of symmetry, and it's non-generic. Okay, so the point is, for our purposes, that the positive result is, if you can measure social structure, identification will generically hold. So what's been called the reflection problem in the literature is actually a non-generic problem. It's a flip, it's a case, it's a flip. Okay, so that's the good news for us. All right, so I think, uh, how am I doing on time? The answer is poorly. So let me uh, then say that the second thing that one can do is to analyze data from aggregate from aggregates. Okay, so the first positive result is if you know social structure, almost always you can identify social interaction.
The second question is, what if I only have aggregate data? So there's cases where I don't observe individual, I observe groups. And so the example there would be that I observe the X bars and I could observe the averages and the variances uh, of each of the groups. And so that's the sort of case that's been studied uh, uh, in, by, by different authors. So the, this is an unreadable theorem, but let me tell you what it says. What it says is that if I have five different groups, everybody with me? I can uncover, and I know the <laughs> social matrices for each of the five groups, then I can uncover the parameters that interest me. All right. I should, for the record, say this theorem is useless. Because what it says is, here's my hypothetical data set. I observe five different villages. I know a, I know the social structures for the villages, but I can't observe the actual behaviors of the individuals. It's very rare that you're going to have a case like that. And the exception is going to be if I assume that the only thing that matters are the averages. Okay. So the point is there are things that you can identify with aggregate data. However, they impose kind of strange information assumptions. Third thing you want to talk about is what happens if I have mixed data and aggregate data. In other words, the best case is I have a community and I get to see all the X's for each person in the community. In some data sets, I can't do that. So take the panel study of income dynamics. What it is is individual level data, but that individual level data is mixed with some, some averages for groups. So this is an example of the way that the data work for the PSA. That is that I would have individuals, so I could see the outcomes omega, I could see their X's, and I could see the average of the X's for the group. Right, you ready with me? So that's good. the data come in the form of omega i, X i, and X bar. So the question is, if I could see omega i, X i, and X bar, what can I learn about social structure? Well. The issue is going to be, in this case, not very much. The way to think about it is that each of the groups has associated with it A and C, as well as the three utility parameters. The problem that I have, if I go back up, sorry, is that if I regress omega against x bar, that's the wrong social structure, unless it the Almost always, that's the wrong social structure. <laughs> so the point I want you to see is that the way that data are often reported for social interactions is actually inadequate to the task at hand. What we would like is to have observations on the individuals within each group, or the observations on the individuals and the associate and the or, and the associated social matrices. At some level, the negative theorem that I've just described is pretty intuitive, because this equation that I'm displaying here is misspecified, because what I react to is not the average of others. It's going to be something much more complicated. But the message here is that one has to be careful in using the conventional data sets, such as the PSID, because they measure the group level variables uh, in ways that may not correspond to actual social structure. So that's the big message in one. All right, so we're on. So what we, okay, we have the theoretical background. We sort of know how to reverse engineer linear models of social interactions so we can see what our theoretical commitments are. And now we have the two extreme cases. If I have no a priori knowledge of social structure, identification fails. If I observe the social structure a priori, identification holds. And as I've emphasized, the literature in econometrics and identification really focuses on the second case. But what I want to argue here is that where, and this is what, again, where I, where I think, you know, if I were to recommend 
kind of metrics of social interactions uh, to the graduate students, well, I think the action should be is asking, what is it we can identify if we know something about social structure? So what do I mean by that? What I mean is that it could be the case that, uh, that I, I don't know everything about social structure, but that doesn't mean I don't know nothing. And so what we do in the paper then is we consider two cases of partial information and consider identity. So let me just talk through the two cases. So here's a possibility. It might be that there are certain contexts where I know the sociomatrix C, but I don't know the sociomatrix B. This is an important point to remember that the way that we develop the model there were some set of social interactions that had to do with the characteristics of people. There's another set that had to do with the behaviors of people. There might be contexts in which I know one of the socio matrices, but not the other. So now, how would I justify a context like that? So here, here's a possibility. I could think about social, the, the A matrix, the endogenous social interactions. Those are really a psychological primitive. If I'm in a classroom, I have friends. Yeah, there's some intensity of the relationships there that uh, constitute the intensity of the friendships. On the other hand, there may be some activities in the classroom who have a known social structure. One example would be a public goods game. So suppose that this is how the classroom works. I'm making it up, this up as a story, but it's not. And that is that every every parent in the classroom has to contribute one tenth of one percent of the family income to a pool of resources that are used to provide equipment for the classroom. Or each family has to contribute the same amount of money. Now, those are called public goods games. People make contributions. And we know that that and the contributions have equal effect. That would be a case for the characteristics of others, their contributions. We know what C is because the effect of the contributions of other people on each person would just be the average contribution. Okay, so the point I want to put on the table, and this has to do again with asking questions about context and reading outside of economics is there may be cases where we're willing to make assumptions about certain types of social structure, but less comfortable making assumptions about different types. So let's suppose that this is the case. I live in a world in which I know the sociomatrix C, but I don't know the sociomatrix A. Okay. Now, there's a bunch of technical assumptions you make because you want theorems to work out. And then you end up with the theorem. And what the theorem, this is again a good example. This theorem is not useless like the other theorem. This is an unreadable theorem. This is what it says in words. It says, if I know the sociomatrix C, then the model is generically identified. In other words, for almost all sociomatrices A, I can uncover gamma, delta, and phi. But then there's a bonus. I can also uncover A. So in other words, if I know one of the sociomatrices, I can uncover generically the other. And so what this says, in fact, one could try to estimate social structure, at least some of the social structure. For those of you that are econometrically oriented, you might ask, why does a theorem like this work? Well, the answer is, uh, it has to do with kind of results in multivariate analysis. So in multivariate analysis, I might say that I have a vector of random variables that is a linear, that's a matrix multiplied by some set of orthogonal random variables. And I want to come up with a matrix that uh, those orthogonal random variables are multiplied by. Right? And so if I think about it that way, and plus I use the, north, the normalizations of the theory, you can show that A is and the theorem in the paper, the proof of the theorem is not uh, tedious, but not, it's really just an extension of that. Okay, so that's, the, as I said, a good piece of news is that uh, if you know one type of interaction structure, you can actually uncover.
final result I want to talk about for thinking in terms of partial identification is what if I know something about networks but not everything? And this is some, an important point that, uh, that, I, that that's worth thinking about if you want to engage in data collection. So as I mentioned, there are some data sets that have network data. It's not assumed, it's empirical. The Ed Health data set could be concrete. Uh, students at a school were interviewed. They were asked to name their five best male friends and their five best female friends. The question is, how do we think about that information? My claim is that the right way to think about it is that that's the information on what's called an adjacency. If you give me a matrix and I replace every non-zero value with a one, that's called the adjacency matrix. And that's how we should think about, and this is the point I want to put on the table quite generally, what I think is the appropriate way to think about network data is that network data is the adjacency. So it tells you the cases where the interaction is non-zero versus the, inter the direct interaction is non-zero versus the direct interaction is zero. Okay, that's the that is what the, social, the, the network data do give us. The problem is that's not the same thing as social structure. In other words, social network data are a reduction of the necessary information for social structure. So that's the first point. That said, we now have a way to think about uh, social, what, what networks give us. If I have network data, the important thing is it tells me who I don't interact with. That sounds strange. You might say, isn't the great thing in network data who I interact with? It turns out what's really helpful is who I don't interact with. So think about it this way. Okay, so let's suppose that, um, uh, that, that there's, there's two students, A and B. Okay, I'm connected to student A, but I'm not connected to student B. If I want to know how student A affects student B, I'm a great instrumental variable because we know that I don't affect student B. You can use me as an instrument to account for the effect of A on B. That's exactly the same thing in simultaneous equations. Exclusion restrictions basically say I can use the excluded variables as instruments for the included exogenous variables. That's what you learn in elementary simultaneous equations analysis. We can think about network data exactly the same way. And so what you can do is you can develop another unreadable theorem. What this theorem says is the following. It says that suppose I want, let's take individual I, all right? I want to identify everything about individual I which means I want to know the parameters of individual I and I want to know the values of their sociomatrices. If there are at least as many people who don't affect me as people who do affect me, then you can identify everything about me. And the reason for that is the excluded individuals can act as instruments for the included individuals. Remember classical simultaneous equations, excluded x's are useful as instruments for included endogenous variables. Exactly the, now, well, as I say, the analogous property shows up in social interactions models. Excluded individuals become instruments for included individuals. And so what happens is as long as you have as at least as many excluded individuals as included individuals, you get the result that identification holds generically. <laughs> and so with that, okay, so I can go through the proof. And, uh, but that's not what uh, is important in terms of the time. What I want is the intuition. And so in some ways I gave it to you. If you know that I'm not connected to, per, to B, then I'm a great instrument to figure out the effect of A on B. And so if you work through those intuitions, this actually told us something very positive. 
and positive thing is that identification is possible under much weaker assumptions as conventional in the literature. And if you think about where econometrics is, there's so much discussion of where we don't want to identify things based on functional forms. Uh, you know, I, I have actually less sympathy for that than, than some. And the reason for that is that I think that the right way to think about assumptions, obviously assumptions are, are, are not, uh, you know, may not, may not literally be true, but we have to ask what, how credible they are and ask how, do we have ways of assessing the sensitivity of things to assumptions, et cetera. But leaving that as the philosophical question aside, what I wanted to say to you is that I think that it's very valuable to ask the question, how can we identify social interaction effects under weaker information assumptions that are conventional? If I said to you that all of the evidence on peer effects in classrooms is conditional on assuming that people only react to the average of other, each student only reacts to the average of other students, that by itself would sound somewhat troublesome. And so what I wanted to do, even though you know, this is, kind of, this is you know, relatively you know, this is really your, pure, your technical issues, is indicate that there are constructive routes to identification that do not require full knowledge of social structure. But in fact, there's ways to proceed that are much more uh, uh, robust to uh, uh, the actual knowledge that we have. Okay, so that's what I want to say about the general identification issues. What I want to now turn to is endogeneity of social structure. And so what I've done in the first, in, okay, you know, just to, to recapitulate, the first part of the talk was what are the micro foundations of social interactions and linear models? You know, I was kind of reverse engineering. The second was the consideration of the relationship between information on social structure and identification. And so we have negative result, there's a narrative positive result, and then some intermediate results. And what I want you to take from that is that uh, well, were two things. One is a matter of doing econometric theory on social interactions. I think where the action is, is filling out the assumptions possibilities frontier. In other words, what can we, what's identified are different assumptions about partial information, plus to recognize that empirical work, there are ways to make the results much more robust. Now, the final question, the thing I want to talk about is the following. And that is the endogeneity of social structure, because the identification results I've given in this half of the talk actually assumed away the big problem. It said that we assumed that the errors were uncorrelated with the included progressors, and so there was no there was no issue of endogeneity as it affects identification. So how, how might one think about hello? How might we think about this? Well, the way to think about it now is I would like to have a richer economic behavioral model. And maybe the model should be in stage one, people form social structure, and in stage two, they make decisions given the social structure. So that's kind of the natural way you do it as a piece of theory. And that's where self-selection is going to occur. In other words, if people form social structures, they're going to form them partially on the basis of things about themselves and the other people are going to interact with, and that's going to be what creates an, an additional identification problem. Now, the way that you want to think about it is that if you have our equation, this term mu x of z is no longer independent of x. In other words, the expected value of my error will be correlated with the observed x's. So in other words, if I think about the endogeneity of social structure, it didn't have any effect on any of the, of the economic theory, the existence of the unique Bayes Nash equilibrium, model, that never assumed social structure was exogenous or endogenous. So it's purely an econometric issue. All right. So let's look at the now, I mean, now notice it said it's not such as when I say it's not such as just a statistical issue, what I mean is that we have to actually have a different model. Doesn't mean how a second stage game is going to be changed. How do we want to think about that? So I think that this, and this is what I want to say. What are the solutions to the selection problem? One solution would be using instrumental variables. Keep in mind the selection problem matters in 
in estimating, and again, I'm focusing on linear models to be concrete. It, it matters because it creates a correlation between the unobserved heterogeneity and the observed heterogeneity. In other words, between the, the error in the model and the included variables. And so a natural solution is to, is to if there are instrumental variables, you use those to instrument the variables that are included in the model. Now, it's not so clear, you know, that's a fine thing to do in principle. The difficulty is constructing instruments that are credible. Okay, so what do we need for instruments? You know this as well as I do. You need the instrumental variable to be, to be correlated with the regressors that are included, and you need them to be uncorrelated with the unobserved heterogeneity. It's the second thing that's difficult. In many of the models that we work with, it's simply difficult to justify the assumption of uncorrelatedness of the unobserved heterogeneity with the instruments. If you can do it, great, but in not many cases you can't. The second thing I want to say is that it might be the case that what we want to do is to estimate a full two-stage game. In other words, have a model of social interactions in which networks form and then interactions lead to choices. The problem with doing a full structural approach is that we do not actually have particularly good, we do not have a general theoretical model of networks. In other words, we have you know, you know, a, a literature with some you know, powerful and interesting models about network formation, but it is not a literature that at this point is, is sufficiently de delineated in the context of, of particular empirical phenomena to be ones that would be easy to, uh, to put, on the pay, put on the table. Further, many of the models of network formation it's, uh, don't have... Uh, have necessarily have strong micro foundations. The reason that they don't have strong micro foundations is it's kind of it's hard to work out uh, rational expectations or self-consistent equilibrium. So often the models that are used in the empirical literature have very crude assumptions about belief form. So that's kind of a very broad and not a very nice thing to say. I guess I think it's a fair statement at this point that one cannot recommend as a, as a generally theoretically compelling model any of the models of network formation that are currently being employed uh, in the economic literature. It doesn't mean that they aren't contributions, but their applications right now are problem. Third strategy that you could use, is everybody with me? Strategy one would be instrumental variables. That's going to depend on whether you can make a credible orthogonality assumption. The second is going to be a, a, a two, would be a, a, two, a full, fully micro two-stage model. I think there, you just don't have uh, economic theory is not a position to provide predictably compelling models at that time. The third solution would, is the following, and that is the way to account for network endogeneity is to not assume that we know the network formation process, but to assume we know certain properties of the network. What do I mean by that? There's an interesting econometric literature, uh, including. A, you know, very nice paper by Su Shen, who's an assistant professor at UCLA, came out a couple of years ago, who basically say the following, and that is, why not just assume that whatever network exists, that it's pairwise stable? All right. So in other words, you don't have a theory of network formation, but you do require that the observed network fulfill certain pairwise stability properties. And what that can be is a route to identity. And just remember, to say the network is pairwise stable, roughly speaking, it means that nobody wants to drop any of the links he or she currently has, and there's no case where people wish to add this. And then whether it's cooperative or non-cooperative, these will be great improvements, but that's not essential for our purpose. But I want everyone to see a different way to think about coupling a model of, uh, of behavior given social structure with a model of endogenous social structure is either to model its the formation of the social structure or to impose restrictions on what social structures we observe. And that's what pairwise stability does. It says we assume the observed thing, however it got there, is pairwise stable. Now, this is very interesting, but there is going to be at least one fundamental problem, and that is there's no guarantee that pairwise, that, that stable networks exist. 
Okay? And so one has to be pretty careful then about the application of these. All right? And so I think that that's actually kind of an important thing. The second point is that when they exist, there can be multiple pairwise through networks, and so it's not always clear there's sufficient empirical content for self-selection. So I think this, and the third thing is perhaps to make the observation that in many contexts, it's not clear that pairwise stability is an appealing way to think about networks. In other words, the uh, idea about the net, you know, because th these types of models really don't think about the, the possibility that networks form for some reason and have consequences. So to make that concrete, I became, you know, if I, you asked me by introspection, who are my friends my freshman year in college, I would say people who had a similar sense of humor to me. They later on might have had other influences on me, but the reasons for the network formation were really logically independent of, uh, of what the consequences were in terms of my academic. And so the serious point is that these are pretty thin visions about social structure. So that's what I had to say to be kind of grumbly that I don't think that the conventional approaches are necessarily uh, wonderful. So let me make a, uh, a proposal. And so my proposal is the following. And that is, we think about, just go back and ask the question, why is it that we care whether or not the network is state is or interested in it for scientific reasons? But the reason we care is because the conditional expectation of the errors given the regressors is no longer zero. So the point is the expected value of that term mu given x is no longer zero. But here's what I want to put on the table. The entire control function literature in economics has to do with estimating this conditional expectation, or at least creating a random variable that is proportional to that conditional expectation. And so that's the elision, that's the original Hecken selection correction. That's where the non the semi <laughs> selection corrections are, and work by, uh, by Moon and, and Johnson at USC actually shows how to do this for networks. And so what I want to put on the table is rather than construct a full theory of network formation, we can actually ask, do we just introduce enough theory to estimate or to create, construct the condition, something proportional to this continuous, this, uh, this, this, this conditional expectation? The answer is that if you can do that, and if you, if you Add that as a regressor, and that will allow you to account for the endogeny of social structure. All right, and so this is uh, and so. Let, let me let me just leave the comment. Now I realize I really am out of time. So let me just say I think that what is the you know the thing I would recommend to researchers interested in this area is to focus on the control function approach to account for network endogeneity. Now, what I want to say is a philosophical matter, I find it's quite appealing because what it says is that if I write down a model with endogenous networks, with endogenous social structure, or I'm worried about, then my model, a model was not adequate. In other words, what I want to do is expand the original model to account for endogeneity. And this is the, the minimal necessary expansion of the model in order to analyze it. <coughs> It turns out that if you analyze, if you uh, then you actually have a nice bonus from control function, which is they can facilitate identification. So Buzz Brock and I showed, for example, that there are contexts in which if you randomly assign people to, to groups, identification fails. That's the reflection problem. But if they end up, if there's self-selection to the neighborhoods, to the groups, identification folds. The reason for that is that self-selection is a behavior. And behaviors will encode the effects of social interactions. And so what I want to leave you with is that this idea of instrumental variables are really model contraction. You say, look at a subset of the model, you get random variation or something. Model expansion says add more economics. And I think that. Uh, uh, there are very good reasons to think that that's a robust strategy, and it's one that can give new, uh, uh, new insights. This is kind of what I want to say, is that what I've tried to now by assumptions, possibility, frontier, I just gave you two points on 
think that if you're interested in this type of work, kind of filling out that frontier is, is useful. The second thing is that there is relatively little that is known uh, about social structure. I'm sorry, about estimation. The third thing is the control functions, except for the Johnson Moon paper, have yet to be developed. And the final thing I want to say is I think that it's well worth thinking about how information, group composition, and prices we use to uncover social interactions. These are other areas that we need to hear. Okay, so what do I mean? Let me just give you an example on group composition. You're probably familiar with the Becker uh, discrimination model. And so Becker had the question of Becker discrimination model was how to think about the relationship between the fraction of employers that are that discriminate against African Americans and the black white wage gap. So Becker's insight, you know, profound insight was that the equilibrium black white wage gap is going to be determined by the marginal discriminator. In other words, that there would be, you know, that that uh, African Americans, if they can, will work for non-discriminating employers. And so then the question is, kind of, what happens? In, you know, is it the case that there's enough non-discriminating employers to cover all out for the American employees, or will the will the black wage be driven down because some African Americans have to work for discriminators? All right. So the upshot is that Becker actually gave conditions in which if you had a uh, fraction of the population of discriminators, you would have no black-white wage gap, because of, at least because of discrimination. This is the point I'm on. The Becker model also tells us that there will be forces that cause segregation of workers across firms. And so I could have a world in which, even though the black-white wage gap is zero, I could still identify the presence of discriminating employers because of the compositions of the of the labor forces, firm by firm by firm, and so more generally, in trying to identify social influences, we should try to use information about the composition of groups, of course, the, the price of group memberships, and that's nothing more than things like house prices. And there's work on that, which uh, has been done, but there's much more. Okay, I think that exhausted my time, and so really, what I wanted to say in the second lecture is that. Uh, there are a lot, you know, there's pretty complicated you know, technical issues in uncovering social influences, but there's actually a fair number of constructive, affirmative identification results. So you shouldn't regard this as, uh, as somehow, you know, fraught with, uh, with with near impossibility results. But furthermore, there, it has a bright future in the sense there's still much work to do. So let me stop there. Thanks a lot.